For decades, the history of the DC Universe has been marked by its crisis-level events, status quo-altering storylines that have rewritten continuity while also providing a meta-commentary on DC Comics publishing itself, and all under a signature red glow. This is Red Skies, a 13-part podcast epic mining these events and the Superman of it all. Welcome to Digging for Kryptonite, a Superman fan journey. I'm your host, Anthony Desiato. This is Red Skies Chapter 8. And joining me in studio to discuss Grant Morrison's final crisis is boss Darkseid himself, the E equals MC squared of despair, Mike San Gregoria. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me back. This is a big one. I, the, yeah, this is this is the biggest one. I, I was very excited when you said uh, it is it is time. It is time to discuss Final Crisis. The second time, in fact, we've done an episode on Grant Morrison's JLA arc, Rock of Ages, as well as Final Crisis. We had our mutual friend Ralph Puma on. This was about a couple of years ago now. Yeah. So not the first time that I've talked about it on the show. But as we're going through this Red Skies event, looking at all of the crisis stories, of course, we had to revisit it, and I'm finding that with this story in particular, each time I come back to it, my perspective shifts a little bit. There's so much to lay out, but just to sort of put this in context, in perspective for our audience, and you've been on to discuss other Grant Morrison works, All-Star Superman most notably at the beginning of this year, but where does this fall for you, just in terms of your Morrison and DC fandom? Uh, this is one of my favorite things by Grant Morrison. Um, uh, possibly my favorite thing they've done that isn't like creator owned. Um, I think it's it's easily as good as Rock of Ages. Um, and if I'm including the the Superman Beyond stories, which are actually my favorite part, uh, I, I I think it's better than All Star. I really do. I, I don't have a single complaint about it. Well, how could you not include Superman Beyond? That goes without <laughs> saying. So listen, the trade that we both read, the collected edition that we both read, I'm sure you have the individual issues as well. I do not. No. I actually, uh, I did not read it when it was coming out. Uh, with As with most Morrison work, I discovered it later. Okay. Interesting. Very interesting. So the collected edition that I, I think we're both working off of now, there is a Final Crisis trade, and then there's also an Essential Edition that DC put out. But my understanding is the contents are the same and they follow what Morrison himself has said is the intended order for this event. Of course, there were a lot of ancillary tie-ins and other miniseries and things like that. But in terms of what Morrison said, this is Final Crisis and this is what's in the Essential Edition and the current trade. We have the short story from DC Universe Zero featuring the narration of Barry Allen. We'll get into all of that. Then it's Final Crisis 1, 2, and 3. Then the two-part Superman Beyond miniseries, followed by the Final Crisis Submit one-shot featuring Black Lightning and the Tattooed Man. Then we're back to Final Crisis proper for issues four and five. Then the two-part Batman Last Rights story that leads us into the final two issues, number six and seven of Final Crisis. So that's what I specifically read. I did also dabble in some of the other one-shots. Final Crisis Requiem, for example, I read that before you came over tonight, which expands on the death of Martian Manhunter that plays out for very briefly in the pages of Final Crisis itself. But in any event, that's sort of, in a nutshell, what we read. Now, as for the story itself, there was a war in heaven, and evil won, and the evil gods of the fourth world fell to earth and took human form and would eventually subject humanity to the dreaded anti-life equation. Meanwhile, in the conscious overvoid that houses the multiverse, on the blank white page of creation itself, an even darker ultimate evil waits at the end of all stories to consume everything. How's that? That's great. That's a very good description of this story. All right. I'm not burying the lead here. I didn't, we specifically did not say anything to each other about this before we sat down to record. The only thing that was said was you said to my wife, you're like, my objective tonight <laughs> is to try, to, to, try to, to turn Anthony, to make him a fan of this, right? So you are going to be very happy to know, Mike, you don't have to try, baby. I am all in on Final <laughs> Crisis. I have had a fundamental shift in perspective when it comes to this. 
I, I really can't stress to you what, what an experience it was going through it all again. So I, I still don't know that I would say I'm right there with you because I, your fandom and your knowledge, your expertise will still, still exceeds mine, but man, I'm a fan. I honestly, it doesn't surprise me because I, I was in the same boat as you when this thing was coming out. I, I didn't read it. I, I had absolutely no interest in it. I was only reading the Morrison Batman run because I really liked the art. And then over time and reading about it and not being able to put it out of my head, I had the same epiphany as you. And then, uh, you know, once you start, it's difficult to stop. Uh, Ralph and I will constantly talk about the Invisibles and Flex Mentallo and all of Morrison's greater own work. But, but this is up there. This is this is a really important work. And every time I go back to it, I read it in a new way and I get new things from it. And there hasn't been one time, including this where I've read it, where I haven't just immensely enjoyed the experience, even though I know what's coming. That's fantastic. I, I mean, I wish I could say that I was there from the jump back in 2008. I, I don't want to rehash this too much. It's funny, though. So much time has passed between that recording I did with Ralph. I really don't remember what I said the first time around. So <laughs> let me just say to any audience members, like if you're new to the show and maybe you recently listened to Final Crisis and you're jumping around or whatever, if I say something, you're like, he just said that in the other episode. I don't remember. <laughs> uh, that's I, one of the beautiful things I think about doing this because it's like, it always feels fresh. But I, so I, I won't dwell on this, but I did read this I guess I, I don't think I really read it as it was coming out per se in 2008, because as I've talked about multiple times at that point, I had decided to switch to the trade. I think I probably, I mean, at a minimum flipped through issues at the comic shop. I do, if memory serves, I think I did at one point take either all of the issues or whatever was out to date home to borrow just to catch up because I was curious. But certainly when the whole thing was done whether it was in single issue form or in trade. I read it that first time and it just did not work for me. And I think that they're not, nah, I know because I see people <laughs> tweet and post about it all the time. So I know, I know there are a lot of people who this did not work for. And I was in that camp at the beginning. And I don't know that I really reread it until I did that episode with Ralph. And when I did, my ultimate, ultimate takeaway was I had a lot more appreciation for it. But I was still like, you know, if you cut out the two-part Superman Beyond and you cut out all the Mandrak stuff from issue number seven and you just focused on Darkseid and the anti-life equation and the battle for Bloodhaven and all of that, it's great. That's what I want it to be. And now I really have come all the way around and I recognize that had it been what I just described, it would not have been Final Crisis and it would not have been this Grant Morrison masterwork. For better or worse, for us, it's better. For other audience members, maybe not. But for better or worse, I think this is exactly what this needed to be and what it was supposed to be. And as I as I reread it this time, I, get, well, I mean, what's different this time? I mean, A, I had that conversation with Ralph. I think Ralph <laughs> set me straight on a few things. He shed a lot of insight. And it def I definitely came away from that conversation, even though I don't remember a lot of the specifics. But I definitely remember being like, oh, yeah, like he made a lot of good points. And be between the two of you guys, I'm like, these are people whose opinions I really value. And then they're so high on it. It's like, I give it, give it another shot. So there was that. Again, I'm also now eight episodes in to this crisis <laughs> event that I'm doing here. <laughs> so I'm really in this mindset and I'm seeing various crises to varying de degrees of quality and effectiveness and various reasons for being. And I think that's given me a more appreciation for this one, I did I did maybe a little bit more outside reading. There was that IGN interview, Inside the Mind of Grant Morrison, that was actually sent to me by George from Shortbox Summary, who was on the show a couple episodes ago. We did Infinite Crisis. But he sent me that link. He's like, anytime I reread Final Crisis, I reread this interview. And I was like, oh, okay. And I read it, and I was like, oh, okay. Like, this sheds a lot of light on it as well. And then I guess the last thing is I just really, I really took my time. I spread this out over a few nights. And basically... I did those first few issues of Final Crisis. Then I did Superman Beyond, mostly by itself. And then I think issues four and five. And then the next day, today, <laughs> I left it to the last minute. Uh, and then today I read those last couple of issues. So like I really, I really made a meal out of it. And I spaced it out and I took my time and I let myself kind of digest everything. And I think too, I just had a better mindset going in. I, like I don't want to make it sound like I forced myself to like it, but I just had this, 
this, again, I don't want to say objective, but just a willingness and openness, right? That in the past, maybe I went in a little bit more skeptical, but this time it was just like, there's something here. Like, I know there's something here and I'm going to get it this time. And I got it. <laughs> that's, that's great. Yeah. That, uh, that makes sense. I mean, this is, this is a, comics began as a disposable medium. Um, this isn't, this is meant to be read over and over, uh, and appreciated, you know, like you would a, a novel. I think it's, um, Neil Gaiman who said something along the lines of, uh, you know, the difference between a work of literature and something else is one you got to read more than once to get something from it. And that's, that's how it is with this. Like I said, the first time I read it, I, I enjoyed it, but I don't love it as much as I love it now. And, uh, you said about doing the outside research. It's like, even I had to keep looking things up and I've read this many, many times. Uh, that's the point of the work. The point of the work isn't that everything is buried here. The point of the work is, um, when you're finished reading what the story is, what it's trying to say to you and what it ultimately does say to you is personal. And it comes to you after you've done the work and after it's sat with you. Um, that's why I always go back to, to Superman beyond because I always tell people like, that's, that's the Superman story I would want to write. If someone, if someone had, you know, whoever's running DC right now was like, you get action comics for two run. I'm like, no, just, just rerun those issues. Cause uh, you know, I think that was pretty perfect. You've shared, you reread that uh, what, on an annual basis. It's very regularly, right? Oh yeah. At least, especially now that all the apps are up. Cause it's like, you know, I, I read a lot. And uh, if I read, if I've read a series of things that just aren't landing, I'll, I'll just pull those up just cause it reminds me of how good, the medium can be, how good the genre can be, uh, and just storytelling in general, because I just feel like that's, that's, <laughs> it's fiction, it's a story about fiction defending itself. <laughs> so it just, it just, it's like going to the gym or something. It just gets you going again. You're like, oh yeah, this is why I did this. Um, the one thing I will, I will say though, um, I hate 3D. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the one thing that I will say is I actually, when I, when I reread it this time, I made a point of not doing the absolute edition because I just, I can't do the 3D. And this isn't on Grant Morrison, any comic that has 3D. Uh, I just, I, I skip it. I just look for scans. I, I can't do it. I don't find it enjoyable. Whatever, whatever they're trying to tell me with that, it, that, that still goes over my head. So I will, I will admit to that. No, nah, dude, totally. So I'm glad you bring that up because that definitely, I mean, I have a vivid memory of really being put off by the 3D. And whether it's movies or comics, whatever it is, like for people who like that, awesome. For me, it has never appealed to me. And I've always found it just kind of silly to be sitting there with my three. Again, if you like that, great. But it's like for me sitting there with 3D glasses, I was like, what am I doing? And so, I, I mean, I feel like the first time I went through this, I did have the, the 3D glasses with those single issues of Superman Beyond. And it does take a while to really get a handle on what's going on in the story. And that's when you're just reading it 2D. <laughs> so putting aside the glasses. So I, I, you know, the first time I read it was definitely, I think I it just really didn't get the full picture. I really didn't get everything that was going on. When I, when I read it with Ralph, I still didn't get everything, but I definitely was a lot closer, but I was still in that, in that camp of like, I don't want to have to work this hard. And for anyone listening to us talk about that, that, if you feel similarly, if you feel, hey, I get what you guys are saying, but that's not what I want out of my crisis type event. I don't want to have to read interviews and do this background material and read the material over and over. I just want to be able to have more fun with it. I really do understand that. But yeah, I'm glad that I got to this point where I actually kind of welcomed this and, and had fun with the process, but, but I, with Superman beyond in particular, and we'll get into it more specifically, that really was where that first time and a couple of years ago, that's where it started to lose me. And, and, the, and there was this frustration that I felt cause I really did. I've always liked those first few issues of final crisis as we're getting into it. And then I just like, I, that was just this huge roadblock for me. It reminds me of the experience that I'm having currently where uh, my son and I were, we've been playing super Mario world on the old, on the classic, uh, mini Super Nintendo, and he loves it, and I love that he loves it, and there are aspects of the gameplay itself that I enjoy, but it's so hard. It's so hard, and I'm not a gamer, and I'm sure that has a lot to do with it, but I feel like this game is just so punishing, and, you know, all these levels, it takes so many tries to get through it, and I bring this up because I'm finding there, there are numerous levels where... 
again, I, I get so close to the end. Times where I see the gate, I see the exit gate, and then I lose in it. Like, it drives me crazy. But it's just this feeling of, like, I'm so close, I'm so close, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, and then I lose. And as I was reading Final Crisis, <laughs> I had this <laughs> sense of, like, okay, I got through the first issue of Superman Beyond. I'm still with it. I hope this stays the same for issue. And then I made it all the way through Beyond. I'm like, oh, my God. I'm like, I'm, I, I, I think it's like I cleared a hurdle. I cleared a level. And then the last real, real test, because I wasn't so worried about Final Crisis 4, 5, 6, but 7. And earlier today, not long before you showed up, as I had it on, on uh, actually, I, I did read it on the app because I like the way it the, you know, just pops on the screen. As I started issue seven, I was like, okay, please, <laughs> like, you've come so far. You've come so far. You've got to stick with it. Keep an open mind. Have fun with it. And, and I did. And, I, you know, if the audience is like, why are you spending so much time talking about this aspect of it? I think with a lot of Morrison work and this one in particular, I feel like it needs to be part of the conversation because I feel like, I mean, I know you've had conversation, I mean, not just with me, but with other friends of ours, right, about this? Oh, yeah. And and going back to, uh, so we're not going to talk about it tonight, but a follow up to Final Crisis is called The Multiversity. And um, when Alternate Realities was still open when it shipped and uh, all the retailers were given a map of the multiverse as a promotional event. And one time I found myself holding court in the back of the store like a teacher and I just had the map open and I was explaining all of this and I had gathered a little crowd around me and that's when I realized like oh I'm 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 translating this this superhero comic because I'm a crazy person and but I'm getting the normals interested in it and that was really excited for me so yeah I I do think it's um it's I, I almost sound like a like an evangelical when I talk about this stuff because I'm like no 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 you just you didn't have your your moment yet you're gonna have your moment and and I try not to force it on people because um, a lot of people too are like well now I just don't want to read it because you like it so much and you keep telling me about it so I I never want to be that person but I I've certainly met plenty of people who are just like oh okay little by little I see what you're saying I see what you're saying so but it is an incredibly dense work it's not you know it's not um. It's, it's not, again, I, I go back to it's, it's, it's written to not be disposable. Like Morrison wanted to give you your money's worth. And I feel like that's the same with a lot of their work. I mean, I, I still read Rock of Ages. It's almost 30 years old. For sure. And especially over the course of doing this podcast, revisiting Rock of Ages and then their entire JLA run with Ralph and All Star with you each time. And I think in part because I know I'm reading these things for purposes of having this kind of discussion. And that just kind of, that lights my fire too. And that adds, that puts a whole other spin on it. So I, I don't know, maybe that makes me more willing to, to put in the work, if that makes sense, as opposed to like, hey, I'm just reading this for fun. And then maybe I don't always want to do that. But for this, it's like, no, 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 like we're, we're, ha we're reading it for this purpose. And that, that motivates me as well. The, the other thing I think it's important to remember about Final Crisis, and I, you could say this really about any crisis story it's a Superman story. It's very explicitly a Superman story. You really like Superman. So it makes sense that the more you read this, the more you're coming away with, you know, this is the person who wrote all-star Superman. This is the person who loves this character. Who's been trying to write them since the early 2000s. Like this is, this is not a casual fan. This is not someone who had to be convinced of the merits of Superman. This is someone who loved them from day one uh, and talks about their power as a, as a fictional character and why that, you know, that's all they need to be. So it doesn't surprise me that, you know, you eventually found something here because the person who wrote it loves the character as much as you do. So kind of on that note, one of the driving themes of this story is the power of stories themselves. And in that IGN interview, it, 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 I felt bad for Morrison in it to a, to a degree because as I'm reading their responses, this was in the aftermath of the publishing of Final Crisis, and they were dealing with all of the blowback from people who were not as on board with it. And again, just reading it, just the the you get the sense from Morrison a, a degree of frustration of like I, that I have to explain all of this. And but but they did say, and I thought this was was interesting. They were like, if everyone across the board told me they couldn't understand this, then that means I did something wrong. But I've heard from enough people who got it, so that I know that it's there. Kind of on that note, I tweeted earlier today that we were going to be recording tonight and our friend Lord Retail from Acme Comics, he replied and he said, Final Crisis is the sort of thing where if you describe it to someone, it sounds incredible. But then when you sit down to read it, 
it's challenging, but it's all there. And if you work with it, it's there. And I think yeah. that's very apt. But Morrison said in that interview, the fact that in the DC universe, there is a story about a genuinely good and moral man, i.e. Superman, who can't be beat. And the fact that the DC universe exists in the real world means that humanity made up a story about, about a genuinely moral man who can't be beat. And just that core idea of Superman that he will never give up and he cannot be stopped no matter what challenge you put in front of him. And, and we see in this story, look, anytime we're talking crisis, any crisis, the stakes are always, are always high, but they're really high in this one <laughs> because we're working on a couple of levels here. Yet no matter what he's faced with, he never backs down. And there's always this sort of calm confidence that he exudes even in, even in the most outrageous of circumstances, even down to that final confronta confrontation with Mandrak. So, yeah, I love the way that, that Superman is utilized in this. And as a couple of other preliminary things I, I did want to ask you, though. So, again, this came out in 2008. In the grand scheme of the crisis events, very shortly after Infinite Crisis, right? Not, not a lot of time passed. That was 2005, 2006, and then a couple of years later we had this. And I know, I know the, the title itself caused some, some joking from fans because I participated in it myself. This whole idea of how could you possibly call, call any crisis event the final one? And over the years since, we've had certain events that are crisis events, even though they don't have crisis in the title, like mm -hmm. Flashpoint. And then we have very recently had Dark Crisis. So clearly this was not the final one. Although I will say, to DC's credit, it was a fairly long period of time before you actually got an event with crisis in its title. But in any event, uh, I know I know where you're going to land, but I wanted, I wanted to toss it to you and let you explain it. Do you feel that in terms of what this story gives us, that the term or the title Final Crisis is an appropriate one for it to bear? Oh, yeah, yeah, very much. Because it's 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 showing you that nothing ever ends, right? Like it's calling itself Final Crisis just to show you the fact that it it, it's never going in. There's always going to be some bigger, more ridiculous battle. And Morrison is just trying to, uh, you know, show you the biggest one that they could think of, which again is, is the entire DC multiverse, everything they've ever published or considered publishing. It's all here. It's going to have to deal with one threat. Can it do it? Of course it can do it. It's led by Superman. Um, let me show, let me, let me show you. But yeah, I, I think it's great because at the very end of final crisis, the world is rebooted and it's, it's, back to exactly where it was and everyone is happy because you know just like you would in the silver age you went on to the next issue and you knew superman saved the day so yeah i, I thought it was great I, I i hate comparing graham morrison and alan moore but i always go back to the scene in watchmen where you know ozymandias says dr manhattan well in the end i did the right thing and without hesitation dr manhattan goes adrian nothing ever ends <laughs> things don't end you know you, you you have to stop thinking like that so the fact that this is called final crisis was morrison's way i think of of saying well okay here's the biggest threat that i could possibly think of and you know what's going to happen at the end it's all going to start again and you're going to have to do this it's 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 ragnarok to to borrow from mythology and across the street it's this idea that every time you retell a story going back to the nature of fiction something about it changes and the person who hears the story retells it and retells it and retells it. So that's the point. It's like, Oh, I'm telling you the story about the end of the world. And then when you tell the story of the end of the world to someone else, you're going to change something or you're going to bring in something that's your own life experience. So I love this because I, I really thought like, you know, Mandrak shows up and every single thing has to be called into question to, to defeat them. And, and when they're defeated, the world goes back to the way it was. And then a couple of years later, flashpoint does the same thing. Like things will always change and they always have to grow. And, and I thought this was really good because in a lot of ways it was the, you know, this, this was pitched at the time, almost like a sequel to infinite crisis, you know, infinite crisis. And then you had 52 and then you had countdown and Morrison was in charge of the one year later stuff. So, the, you know, there, there was a lot of buildup to final crisis. It didn't just come out of nowhere. Um, and then, you know, after this, things would be a little weird for a couple of years and then you'd get the new 52. But, uh, you know, the, the, the potential there was really to say, well, okay, you've been given a new multiverse. What do you want? What do you want to do now? What things do you want to change? And 
um, they didn't really take advantage of that. But but I, I, I think the name is perfect because it reminds you that like it's always going to seem like it's the end, but it's not because Superman's going to find a way through for us. Well said. Well said. Yeah, there's... Actually, one other thing I wanted to ask you, because I was reading, I think this was just on Wikipedia, but they had quotes from various interviews Morrison had given, and they talked about how when they came back to DC, you know, years before this, they had this idea for something called hyper crisis that would, and we have talked on the show about hyper time and, 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 and all that business, but that there was this idea for an event called hyper crisis. And then eventually that kind of got carved up and certain ideas went into all star Superman and someone into final crisis and someone into seven soldiers of victory. But that, that matches up with your understanding as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I don't know if hyper crisis was related to, um, an earlier story they had pitched, which was basically, you know, the opening of Final Crisis, the idea of like, well, Jack the King Kirby never got to complete his fourth world saga. He he got a he got an epilogue of sorts that kind of sees all the the pieces, but he never really got to tell the story. I think Morrison was basically like, well, can I tell that story? <laughs> like, can I show the the final battle in, in heaven between the devil and the devil's son and, and all this other stuff? And, uh, you know, you, unfortunately, you, you don't see it. He, Is, yeah, so that was that was the other piece. So. I did not, and I was happy to do the homework that I did, but I was not going to commit myself to the countdown to Final Crisis series. I also did not read the Death of the New Gods miniseries. My understanding, and the way you're shaking your head, I think you'll confirm this. <laughs> My understanding is that although these projects were intended to tie in, to lead into Final Crisis, that they really didn't, that there was a bit of a disconnect and Morrison was really doing their own thing and these miniseries didn't line up. Is that, is that right? I got to be honest with you. I have no idea because every time I read Final Crisis, I think to myself, you know, I really, really like Jim Starlin, who's the one who did Death of the New Gods. There's no reason not to read this. So I'll just, I'll look it up. And I always find like the same reviews that are like, this has nothing to do with anything. <laughs> and then I just go back and I read Infinity Gauntlet again. Um, <laughs> and as far as Countdown, again, I don't know anyone who worked on that book. I have read numerous interviews where people were just like, this is not a good comic and we're sorry. <laughs> so I, you know, I like 52. I, I, I think it's unfortunate the way it ended, but I think for the most part, a weekly story is very difficult to tell. And it just sounds like countdown wasn't worth the real estate. I, I just read and we covered 52 and I had such a blast. That was the first time I read it, but yeah, countdown, the countdown series, I, I just, I couldn't bring myself to do. And, and yeah, my understanding based on everything I've read is that it just, it, they did not sync up. So it didn't really necessarily feel worthwhile. Oh, I do want to just jump back to your story about your map, your map, <laughs> your, your multiverse geography lesson. Cause I actually mentioned that in our 52 episode to tee this up. And I was telling our, our guest Scott about, about exactly what you described and how, our mutual friend and fellow guest, Rich Roney, he was such a good sport. I remember him. And we know Rich, and the audience has gotten to know Rich as well. There are certain things he's really interested in and other things he's not. And I think his, his, the attention that he paid you in that moment, I think, is a testament to friendship, right? And the fact that he, he knew how passionate you were about that and he wanted to participate in that way. That's a hundred percent true. Rich is, is very, he's very kind with his time and with his attention more so than, than I would be in his shoes. But I, I will say that when I was going through something, I, I like to, um, I like to think of the audience and in Rich's case, I know him well enough that I can kind of say, well, what are you, what are you interested in? You know, the, the meat and potatoes of superhero story, but I also know you like, Kirby as much as I do. You you like the Marvel stuff. You you like the Silver Age stuff. Well, so does Morrison. And I kind of showed him on that. And I said, hey, all the stuff you like is over in this part of the map. And there's a reason for that. And again, if he was faking interest, I'll take that. I, I don't tell my I tell my wife this all the time. I don't mind if you're faking it as long as you're paying attention to me. Um <laughs> but but Rich Rich was a very good sport and uh, you know, one of the best conversationalists I know. Cause again, even if even if his heart's not there, if the person he's talking to is very interested in it. He'll, he'll carry the conversation. Um, but, uh, yeah, I always, I always think of him too, because I would never recommend final crisis or invisibles or anything like that to him. But if I can talk about aspects of it to him, then who knows, maybe, uh, you know, maybe I, I get him along the line. I learned my lesson with him. I, years ago, I tried recommending fables because I figured if there was one thing 
outside the realm of traditional DC Marvel superhero comics that he might gravitate towards. That would be it. And I tried. And again, he listened very politely, but that was as far as it went. <laughs> but I wanted to back up because I, I agree with you to an extent about how, again, this came so closely after Infinite Crisis in 52 and, and was really part of that era of DC. So you're right. It didn't come out of nowhere. However, what I will say to this story's credit, and I think that this is one of the things that makes it especially interesting now looking at Crisis on Infinite Earths, Zero Hour, and Infinite Crisis, and all the other ones we're going to look at. Infinite Crisis does still remain my personal favorite. Uh, and we talked about how that was one of the reasons that worked so well, in my opinion at least, is that there was so much leading into it. All of those miniseries. And it really felt like a story of the moment that really tapped into everything that was going on in the DC Universe. Now, the flip side of that is if you were to just give that to someone cold, I don't know how much mileage they would get out of it. I think that would be a little tough. Final Crisis, on the other hand, also would be tough to give to someone, <laughs> but only in the sense that, how do I put this? I feel like everything you need for Final Crisis is in Final Crisis. It's just that you have to work through what's there. With Infinite Crisis, the challenge is more that you you need more of the, of the, the buildup and the ancillary material. Whereas with Final Crisis, and the other thing too, it doesn't feel as mired in the continuity of the moment. Yes, there are things you can point to and be like, oh, that was that's what was going on at the time. But again, there aren't even a ton of instances that come to come to mind, right? You look at maybe the Justice Society characters who were in play, and it's like, okay, that's the lineup that Jeff Johns was using in the books at the time. But there's not nearly as much that feels like it's tied to a specific era. I feel like there is far more of a timeless quality to final crisis where you could you, you could look at that you could look at it more in a vacuum and i think it would work to a degree that most of these other crisis events at least that we've looked at so far would not and could not and that's not necessarily a knock right because part of what can be really fun about these crisis events as we've talked about is that they, they are dialed into what's going on in the book so it cuts both ways but that's for me that's one of the things i really like about final crisis is that it i feel like it stands on its own vastly more so than most of these other ones. Oh, I agree completely. Yeah. I mean, listen, you know, we only have to look at Morrison's history to realize that they know if I can get it in a book as quickly as possible, more eyes are going to be on it. I mean, their first big mainstream success was Arkham Asylum, which is an, an original graphic novel. And it's, it's the same thing here. Like, I really do believe that this was written with the intent of giving it to someone who knows who Superman is and knows who Batman is and is going to be walking through at the time whatever the bookstore um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, listen, if you know who the Alpha Lanterns are and you know why Bloodhaven was blown up and you know why they're giant Dalmatians and, and, and all this other stuff that gets thrown in, well, then great. Hopefully it pays off stories and, and books that I certainly wasn't reading. Uh, but if you don't know any of that, then to your point, well, you're going to get enough context just from the story because you're going to follow characters who are also learning about that, you know? There's a there's a big through line of Final Crisis about the character Renee Montoya. And if you just remember that character from Batman the Animated Series, you are going to be like, why are they the question? By the way, what is the question? And I don't understand any of this. But by the end, you see why they were there and why it was important or why she was there and why she was important. So I, I do think that everything is there. But I, I think that Morrison was also trying to serve two masters because there is a lot of stuff in here uh, that's just you know, it, it had to, it's a, both an event and a crossover. So things have to cross over. Uh, and nowhere is that more apparent than Batman. Cause if you weren't reading that Batman run or you were reading that Batman run, I mean, those are two major streets that intersect. And, and this was, um, this was a big fight that I had back at the time because people I knew who were only reading the Batman run who were like, I do not want to read Final Crisis, it sounds terrible. Just tell me why Batman is dead. And it's like, well, it's a complicated question. <laughs> um, that was a that was a big thing at the end. You you actually mentioned rereading the two uh, Batman issues. I think they're called Last Rights. A lot of the times I skip those because they're great, but they're, you know, they are they are a Batman story <laughs> that uses uh, everything that was going on in, in the Bat books at the time, which were in their own separate crossover, but also like fourth world concepts that haven't been seen since the 
seventies. <laughs> so those those are kind of tough because you're reading that and you're like, what's the lump? What is mockery? What is simi? Like those are characters that I had to like look up um, back in the day. So I I agree, but I I do think if you were reading all that stuff at the time, you'd be like, oh, okay, I vaguely understand how this crosses over. I, I will say that the submit one shot. I was okay with that. I feel like that lifts out fairly easily, but at the same time, you know what? It was a little bit of a palate cleanser after Superman Beyond, where you're you're you have to upgrade to 4D vision to figure out what's going on, and then you have this very vastly more grounded sort of nuts and bolts story that shows what's become of the DC universe after Anti Life's been enacted. So. It actually, it serves, I think, kind of a valuable function, and I'm okay with it, and it's a quick read. The Batman two-parter, I go back and forth on that, exactly for the reasons you just described. I, I, I guess the one thing is that I feel like last time, I don't know last time if I read, if I reread those. I might not have, and certainly the first time I didn't. And if you don't have that, Batman showing up in Final Crisis 6 is like just crazy abrupt. He's just there on a page all of a sudden and, and you're like, what, what happened? Yeah. So I think for that, if nothing else, and you also just see what mental journey he's gone through before what, what appear to be his final moments. Of course yeah. we know they're not. So I, I think it, it works, but you know, your points are well taken. And I, and I do, I do still go back and forth on those two. It's like, ah, do you, do, would you include the, do you, would you recommend those to someone to read? <laughs> That's the thing. Guys, if, if you're an audience member and you haven't read this, or you haven't read it in a while and maybe we're, we're turning your mind, you're changing your mind a little bit. Even that, I don't know. I might say to just kind of skip over that Batman two-parter and just know that he's had this mental journey in between issues yeah. five and six and and then you're good to go. I mean, it's it's a great Batman story. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's about, you know, if, if Morrison writes Superman very, very well, you know, their very long Batman run was kind of convincing themselves that Batman was really good too. And one of the things that they often go back to is not only... Is Batman not a loner, which was very popular at the time, but Batman can weaponize anything to his advantage. And my favorite line in The Last Rites is one of the characters literally says he's weaponizing his own trauma <laughs> to defeat the god of darkness. And I thought that was great because, you know, anti-life is about convincing you how miserable life is in a lot of ways Batman's primary arc is I know how bad things are. I just have chosen not to give in to despair. I'm going to fight back. I'm going to punch this clown in the mouth. And every time an orphan shows up in my door, I'm going to invite them into my giant mansion. So it is a good story. It's just for me, it just breaks up the flow a little bit, but I've also read separately. I've read the Morrison run a dozen times. I mean, I could talk about Batman incorporated for hours. We did an, we did an episode of one of my old podcast series on it. That's still out there. And that's one that I, I kind of would like to revisit, especially after doing all of this, I guess one last note, as far as just the well, actually, two things real quick on the, the publishing side of it. So I laid out what what I did reread for this. I purposely did not do Final Crisis, Legion of Three Worlds, the Jeff Johns, George Perez five-issue miniseries. We are going to get to that next year. All will be revealed soon, and it'll make sense. But my memory of it and my research that I, I've done on it, it seems so wholly divorced from the main proceedings of Final Crisis that I didn't want to delve into that. And then, like I said, when we were talking about 52 a couple of episodes ago— I, I really do now have an itch to read Greg Rucka's Crime Bible and Final Crisis Revelations miniseries to see more of what he did with Rene Montoya as the question and, and Chris Allen as, as a specter. But I didn't delve into that at this point. I really focused on the Morrison stuff. But the last thing, and Morrison even addressed this in that IGN interview that I keep referring to, but just from a, from a logistical publishing standpoint, I, I do kind of, and I guess it doesn't matter now because you have the trade and you have it in the order that Morrison wanted, so it's fine now. But I do think that publishing Superman Beyond as a separate two-part miniseries, I feel like that was a misstep because it is so essential to the overall story. And I feel like making it a miniseries, even though it, it is its own thing to an extent, but if you don't have that foundation, that building block, you're, that issue seven is going gonna, is gonna to lose you. Right. So I don't know. I feel like initially maybe that it could have been incorporated into the main series i just assumed that it was published separately because at the time it was a different artist so mm -hmm. i just assumed you know for for those who aren't aware um the first 
half to two thirds of Final Crisis is done by the artist of J.G. Jones, who my understanding is while they are amazing, they're not exactly the fastest person in the world. Um, and at least the last issue, if not the last two issues, they're not the artist. Um, it's the artist of Superman Beyond, Doug Monkey, who I love, who's one of my favorite artists of all time, full stop. Um, that's another reason I love those books very well. I just assumed that when they were coming out, Morrison was like, well, I'm going to write Final Crisis for J.G., and while they're working on this, you know, this big, huge book that is driving the DC publishing line, I'm going to do this other script over here for Monkey, who's much faster, and I'll, I'll work it out. And, and you know, you can buy both at the same time if you want. I'm sure Editorial is very happy about that. But then when it became obvious that J.G. wasn't going to be able, they just went back to Doug and were like, well, you can process his nonsense scripts. Do you want to do the last <laughs> issue? I've, I've literally listened to interviews with, with, with a Monkey who describes it that way, where it was like, you can do this. Do you want to do the last one? And he was like, yeah, sure. Well, it's the worst that could happen. That, that totally makes sense. I, I absolutely can buy that. And it is interesting now when you look at all of it together, because it, it's still, yes, in an ideal world, if one artist, either of them could have, could have done it all. We also had Carlo, the late great Carlos Pacheco. He, he pitched mm. in as well uh, for, for some of it as well. Yeah. But yeah, in an ideal world, of course, we always love if one artist can draw the whole thing. But it, it ends up working nicely here because you have Monkey doing the Superman Beyond two-parter in the middle and then doing all of issue seven. But issue seven picks up and continues so many of those threads from Superman Beyond. So it really feels like, oh, OK, we're back in this gear of the story yeah. and the art is shifting accordingly. So yeah. it, it, it does actually end up working really nicely. Yeah, the the end of, of Final Crisis where the Green Lantern Corps fight Mandrak, the uh, vampire monitor, and it's just, there's that great shot of Stake the Vampire, and Hal is leading the entire core against Mandrak. I can't, I love J.G. Jones, but they are a different type of artist, and Monkey just nails that. So that's one of those, like, when, when people ask, like, what is one of your favorite panels of all time? I mean, I'll send half a dozen from this book. But that's one of the ones where it was like, this is what I want from the Green Lantern Corps. The whole thing, working in unison to take down a, a cosmic vampire. I just, oh, I love it. It just nails for me. It lands for me, excuse me. Yeah. No, no, no. It was, it was terrific. The, the other thing kind of in, in looking at all of these crisis events together, what stands out about this one is any of these crisis stories, in some way, shape or form, it, it's an existential threat. Right. The stakes are astronomically high, yet because this story is working on a few different levels, at least two more, I'm sure, but at least two, I feel like it, it, it just feels like a different beast. When we go back to Infinite Crisis, which again, I, this does not take away from my love of Infinite Crisis. I had so, so much fun going back and reading that again. But there too, it's like, yes, there is this threat that the DC earth that we've been following is going to be wiped out and replaced by what Alexander Luther and Superboy prime come up with. Right. Yet there's still something that feels more tangible about, about that threat that this world is going to be replaced. Right. We're bringing back the multiverse and this is going to be wiped out. Whereas here you have the threat of dark side and anti-life, but then you also have this very crucial point that, it certainly is mentioned, but that well, I'll speak for myself. Maybe the first time I read it, it didn't really register this whole idea that it's not just the anti-life equation and the armies of dark side. It's literally dark side's presence on earth that is warping time and space. And he's creating this singularity at the core of the planet. And actually Ralph had a great point when we did that other episode, when we talks about how, you know, time feels so screwy as you're reading this and how much time is passed. And that's by design. Right. And it's one of those things where if you're not totally dialed into it and you're reading it the first time, you might feel like you're you're missing something or, or whatever the case may be. But when you factor that in, it's like, no, just the presence alone is warping everything. And that's not even the end of it. <laughs> it's then that there's this ultimate evil beyond all of this. Right. Mandrak, this parasitic vampire that wants to devour the multiverse. That's the final evil that's waiting beyond dark side. So again, I feel like all of that just puts this on, on a different level. And it also, another thing that we've been talking about is sort of why each of these crisis events exists. And yes, ultimately they exist to sell comic books. But beyond that, <laughs> a lot of them, as we've talked about, have a very 
there's sort of a, a mechanical function that they need to serve for the company. We need to consolidate our vast multiverse and create a streamlined continuity. So much for that, but that was the intention, right? With yeah, Crisis. Yeah. And then with, with Crisis on Infinite Earths, I mean, I'm sorry, with, with Infinite Crisis, I, I do genuinely feel that was more about paying homage to the original Crisis and having this 20th anniversary sequel. But even there too, it's meant to kind of play off of this other story that came before. Zero Hour wanted to clean up some timeline and continuity glitches, allegedly. Yeah. <laughs> so far, my least favorite of the, all the ones we've talked about. And I think when we get to the end of this and we do sort of our oh, best and worst. it's a crisis in time, It's crisis right? in time. They oh, threw that in there. Everybody that. forgets about oh, that, but that's there. We're here to remind everybody. That. Okay. But this, this to me feels just like, you know, like Morrison talks about this noble character. There, it, I feel like there's a noble <laughs> reason for this story or, or motivation for this story that it's not about... This is not about continuity cleanup. This isn't about wiping away or bringing back a multiverse, maybe showing the potential of having a multiverse, right? But even that, it this feels more story-driven than and, and feels like it comes from a purer place than a lot of what else we've, even though I've enjoyed what we've been talking about so far. But do, do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I do. It's, it's what I was saying before about... Um, it's why it's called final crisis, right? It's, it's, it's really, yeah, there's a threat, but it's really about explaining what we get out of these crossover events in general. So, you know, there's, there's, there's twin conflicts in final crisis. One is that the presence of dark side is going to make everything bad because dark side is a, is a God and you know, dark side just doesn't show up with armies and want to conquer it. No, no, dark side is the God of control. And if he gets this thing, that's it. That's, that's, that's all she wrote. Uh, but the other thing is also, and this is, this is the Mandrax story. And for me, this has always been the most complicated part. It's about the reader and the creator's relationship with fiction. And it's like, are you getting what you want out of this? Or are you just buying the next one out of habit? And that to me is what Mandrak represents. Cause Mandrak to me, is every single person who's mad when continuity changes or they're not getting something out of this or, and I've been there. I've, I've yelled about complete nonsense, um, at the top of my lungs, but Mandrak is a really good, um, mirror to kind of hold up. And, and I don't think Morrison's trying to insult everyone. I think Morrison's just saying, we have to be, we have to watch out for this. Um, but, but to go back to your point about dark side, you know, in the DC universe, if Superman is, is good, dark side is evil. That was, that was the point, you know, people often forget, but dark side was created in Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen, dark side fought Superman from day one. Dark side deserves his place in, in the super rogues gallery. So to me, dark side is just, this is the, this is the ultimate threat. This is the ultimate evil. And he's here and his very presence is corrupting everything. And regardless of how that's going to show up, Superman needs everything to defend and that was what it was in Crisis on Infinite Earths, right? Superman had to stop the Anti Monitor. Well, how's he going to do that? Well, he's going to get everyone from every world that's left because only he can do that. And you know what happens in Infinite Crisis? Well, he goes and he gets Earth Two Superman, the Golden Age Superman, the very basis for the word superhero, uh, to try to stop a, a version of him that's fallen uh, off the path. And uh, you know, it's the same thing here. The the Superman of the multiverse, the the idea of Superman passed through a prism, uh, Ultraman, all of that. It's about this idea of how many different ways can we have this character and they're going to face the ultimate evil, whatever that is. If it's in the DC universe, it's probably going to be Darkseid, but how do they overcome that? And of course, as we all now know, Darkseid hates music. Yes. Yeah, and Superman whistles to stop him. He's the only person who you can give the godlike power of restructuring the universe to who, you know, isn't going to mess it up. You know, that's, and I, I think that's beautiful because I, I, I agree with that. You know, if you want someone to reconstruct the world from the ground up, that doesn't include the malice uh, of, of dark side. It's, it's gotta be Superman. Cause you know, he's the only one who's like, no, I think every single person deserves another chance. And uh, you know, he, when he says it, he's not saying it to be, uh, a, a coy or annoying, he actually believes it, which is the point of his story. If you read that, you should believe it too. And, you know, if we're lucky, we'll get there. So beautiful. And I agree about Darkseid. 
reading this, you know, certainly it makes me think of Superman, the animated series and the DC animated universe generally, where Darkseid was this ultimate opponent. And of course, famously in my two favorite episodes of Superman, the animated series, he kills Dan Turpin. So Takes him right down. to see Turpin play the role that he does in this, where he's investigating these missing meta kids at the start of the story. And that leads him to the dark side club and boss dark side, which is the human form that that dark side has taken. And then eventually mm-hmm. dark side takes over Turpin himself, but Turpin is able to resist in the end. If I'm not mistaken, he lives at the end of this, right? He comes out of this alive. Doesn't he? Turpin. Turpin. I could, I feel like he oh, was standing. No we don't hold me to that. Well, I'll oh, double check. Okay. But my, my memory was, oh, he's dead by the, by the time this is done. But I swear in that final battle, like he was standing there because there's that point where quote unquote dark side is like not, dark side and then you realize it's turpin has has regained control Mm -hmm. i feel like he makes it out but in any event but so there's the animated universe of it all and then because we always have to bring it back to smallville smallville featured dark side a version of dark side in its final 10th season and i actually have to retroactively go back and give smallville more credit because they played dark side as this smoke monster that was the embodiment of all evil and At the time, I've sort of felt like, even though actually Final Crisis had been published by this point, but again, I wasn't, it wasn't my thing at the time. And you're watching and it's like, all right, Smoke Monster, we've just had Lost. So it's like, okay, that felt the derivative of that. And and Buffy the Vampire Slayer in its final season did the first, again, the, the living embodiment of all evil. So this felt like we were taking a couple of ideas and kind of smooshing them together because we can't show the traditional depiction of Darkseid on a CW TV budget. And it was fine and it, and it, you know, and it, and it worked well enough. But I feel like now after this, I have even more appreciation and respect for the Smallville take on it. And it has even more of a basis in the con. Because I guess so many of the stories do play Darkseid as this, this alien dictator, right? But this story really, you know, really shows, again, that the, the corruption of the soul that Darkseid brings about just by his very presence on the planet. So... Again, yeah. I love, love Smallville even more is the point. And, uh, you know, that ties into something that Morrison says a lot, which is, um, you know, when Kirby created the fourth world, the new gods, dark side, what have you, Kirby made a point of calling them gods. And that wasn't just because he was the guy who, who did Thor. Like Kirby was a devoutly religious man. Like he understood the difference between a mortal and an immortal, a man and a god. And it's this idea that, you know, dark side isn't just, an evil dictator. He's not Mongol. He's not Thanos. He's not any of these other people. He, he, he's the embodiment of something. And and in their other work, Morrison talks about how, you know, back in the day when we started writing down, well, what are our gods? The idea was when, when we have an emotion, when we have a feeling, when we're channeling something, we're going to give that the name of a God, right? I'm, I'm angry. I want to, I want to act out. I want to do something. Well, that's the God of war. And we're going to give that a name. And that's why every pantheon's got a God of war because we all get angry and God of love and everything else. And it's the same thing here. And Morrison said, okay, well, the greatest combo creator of all time created the God of evil. And he did that after going to world war II and knowing his Bible very well. So what is this character? Why is he so powerful? Why does he keep sticking around? You know, he showed up, he immediately went to cartoon with superpowers. Like he is he is not a character that had to wait for his moment. He arrived fully formed. Um, and that's what I like about Final Crisis, because it really says, like, Superman can't punch Darkseid. You know, in, in the DCAU, they set it up so that he can, and it's one of the most rewarding things I've ever seen. But Final Crisis, you can't punch Darkseid. You can. And even if you wanted to, he's in, he now he's in the body of one of your good friends, so you're not going to want to. Uh, and it's really this idea of how do you beat the god of evil? Well, you show him that we can overcome that and you do that by example and and i love final crisis because the way he beats dark side is again by by having a better thought by telling a better story of a world without dark side and the universe comes together coalesces and allows that to to happen so i just i think it's a beautiful thing but at the same time morrison knows how to write a superhero comic so we need something to punch mandrak shows up (laughs) and everyone gets to punch mandrak and it's so rewarding no, that's a great point. I, I, you know, I still have not read the original Kirby fourth world material. I feel like at some point I will get there, but yeah, I feel like most of the stories featuring dark side that I've read at most, they, they do tap into certainly the, the despair that he 
cultivates in his subjects and feeds off of, but not, I guess my view of dark side is still more of that Mongol esque alien dictator. And I feel like that's what most stories lean into. And those episodes of Superman, the animated series are my favorite episodes. So again, it totally works, but I liked, I liked the, the, the path that this book took. I thought it really, it really elevated it and it was, it was so interesting. So yeah, you know, I really dug that a lot. You know, the other thing that people forget with dark side that I always, I always tell people, I'm like, you know, dark side is one of those rare villains who's, already conquered his world you know like the superman especially fights a lot of bullies fights a lot of fascists he fights a lot of people who want to exert their control over everyone else but you know from day one dark side's like no i already conquered my world you know the the entire world of apocalypse is dark side's vision and it's it's, it's an absolute dictatorship uh, you know, he killed his father to get control over it. He went to war with heaven. They reached a stalemate and that is it. You know, you know, he already conquered his world. He's got all the resources, he's got all the subjects and everything else. And, you know, Kirby's original story in the fourth world, there's violence and there's, there's all that other stuff. But fundamentally when he's on earth, he's like, one of you has this equation and it shouldn't be here because you're a backward back in you know, a backwater world. But it's here. I don't know why it's here. I'm going to find out what's so special about you. And of course, he keeps getting turned away by Dan Turpin and Jimmy Olsen and the forever people and everyone he finds here who is like, well, if you're here, then this is a place worth saving. Um, but 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 yeah, I mean, Darkseid is one of those characters where it's like, well, he's already conquered his world. What else does he want? Um, which I always thought was, was really good. It's very similar to another Kirby creation, Dr. Doom. Of like, you know, arguably the best character, the best villain in Marvel. It's like, what does he want? Well, he wants something specific, but it's not just conquest because he already conquered his, his country and, and that country exists under his rule and no one's going to deal with that. So when he goes outside of that to do something else, it's, it's very specific, uh, which I always thought was great because again, you know, Kirby understood uh, how dangerous fascism was and he was, he was commenting on that, uh, which, which I think is why these characters, again, they arrive fully formed and they, they really haven't changed in decades. But yeah, the, the, the dark side that we see here is, is this concept of like, when you feel hopeless, when you feel sad, when you, you know, I, I used to describe it as like, you know, have you had depression? Okay. That's what final crisis is about. Like when you feel absolutely awful, that, that feeling could be called dark side. And I know that sounds ridiculous. I'm in no way a mental health professional, but that's kind of what the story is. It's like, this is control. This is hopelessness. This is that pit. This is that black hole that is drawing you down that you don't think there's any liberation from well in the world of final crisis superman's going to grab you and pull you back towards the light oh that's so beautifully said now of course the snarky commenters out there might say you feel depressed reading this because of how dense it is and so on i'm sure i made a similar joke about that at some point but not anymore but no i man you said that perfectly and along those lines one of the things that i found especially interesting was that dark side actually enacts the anti-life equation. It's always this MacGuffin that he's chasing, right? And it's a great device to put him into conflict with the other characters. And yes, you get something like Rock of Ages where you get to see what happens when that actually comes to pass, but it's this alternate future that they're able to avert. But here, like, that's the thing about this. It's like, yeah, no, you, you, you have to have a DC story at some point where this actually comes to pass and you see how the DC universe deals with it. And what, what adds to my interest is that because it's this MacGuffin, because there's something that's always very, very nebulous about it, right? It sounds very hazardous. It's like, okay, well, you know, that it doesn't sound good. I thought I love in the in Final Crisis, there's this bit where Ollie is gonna stay behind to send Dinah and the rest of them off. And and she's like, you gotta be careful. And he's like, Don't worry, I'll use the anti-anti-life equation arrow. <laughs> love that. I love that scene so, good. so much. It's so good. But you know, all along you always wonder, or at least I always wonder, it's like, what if he gets this? What does it actually do? How, how does it function? What, what are the actual mechanics of it? And we see over the course of this story that there are a number of people who are subjected to it via helmet, right? It's placed on them and it's the signal that it's transmitting to them. Uh, and then the billions of people across the earth uh, are, are exposed to it via an internet strike where it's broadcast across every device, every platform, everything. And this is in 2008. Yeah. <laughs> We've come a long way since then. Yeah. But when it actually comes to pass, yeah, it is this total 
removal of free will. And I think your description of it as the equivalent of depression, of the qualities that would be that would accompany that, I think I think that's spot on. I think that's what this is meant to meant to be. And so yeah, for anyone who's still you know, kind of wrestling with, oh, wait, what, what, what exactly is this? I think that's it. I think that really is it. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the term anti-life equation is this idea that there's a mathematical proof that if you hear it and you can understand it, you don't believe that your life has any meaning. Since dark side is the God of control, you've thus given yourself to them and dark side just, you, you, you see in Vinyl Crisis that everyone who hears the equation and accepts it, because there are some people who are immune to it, um, and that's a very important part of the mythology, that Darkseid says, well, you're just an extension of me. You know, you are just, you're another finger on the hand. You, you no longer have your individuality, and that's because you came to a point where you realized life wasn't worth living. Um, you mentioned the submit one shot before, and uh, I, I actually think that's great because you see two uh, men, a traditional superhero and a traditional supervillain, and they both have families. They both have kids and then wet wives and everything else. And when confronted with anti-life, they both say the same thing. Well, I have to protect my family. And you know that if they get uh, possessed or infected with the equation, they won't want to do that anymore. And they can't think of a fate worse than when than that. So I thought that was a really way, really good way of explaining it because it's it's one thing to just say, oh, he's going to be mind controlled and he'll be back. And it's like, well, yeah, but you know. If you have a family, if you have something you value and you could suddenly decide, well, that's not worthwhile anymore, then Darkseid has won in, in multitudes. Uh, so I thought that was a really good way of, of showing it off. But um, yeah, the, the the helmets are another <laughs> holdover from the fourth world where there was a story about the justifiers and everything else. But in my mind, it's like if you hear the equation and you're not Mr. Miracle, you're probably going to want to kill yourself, you know, unless Darkseid is like, no, I need you for something. So go, you know, go. Your life only has value because Darkseid needs something from you. So The first folks we see who have succumbed to it are those missing meta kids that Dan Turpin has been tracking down. And they're in the Darkseid Club. And Boss Darkseid explains, we taught them how to say the equation. And they've got the red eyes, no helmets. There are a couple of points where we see in word balloons, we see portions of the equation. Self-doubt times mockery, you know, et cetera, things like that. You know, that's probably sufficient. Is there any part of you that, like, did you want to see the full proof? Like, did, or, or is it enough to know, okay, th those are some of the ideas, I guess, that are being, that are being, you know, implanted on all of these people and, and that's enough? Or, or did you want to see more of like, what would actually, or is that too dangerous to put in a click? <laughs> Mo Morrison actually did it because, you know, Morrison's a, a magician <laughs> and they actually put it in there. I, I don't. I don't know if it's in the collected edition we're looking at. It's certainly in the absolute, um, but yeah, it, it, to me, to me, it's unnecessary. I, yeah. I mean, it's it's. I'm not a filmmaker, but it's the old horror movie trope of yes, whatever you can imagine. Once you've been convinced of the threat, is going to be far more terrifying than anything to put in there. I, I always use that example too of you know, in Final Crisis, you do not see Orion fight Darkseid. You're only told about it. And I like that too, because it's this idea of like, well, if the God of fighting, the God of war, the God of struggle of the new age is fighting his father, the God of control, what's that fight like? And and it's like, well, you, you, you could never even see it. You, you can only, you know, have to imagine it. Uh, and um, since Kirby never got a chance to, to draw it outside of, of hunger dogs, it's like, oh, okay, I'm going to, I'm just going to let my mind wander with that. You know, I'm going to use my best uh, uh, Thor impression, but um, yeah, I don't. I, I I think once you understand how dangerous it is, and 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 what it's trying to tell you is a storytelling mechanism, then whatever you come up with is is terrifying. I mean, everyone's been, everyone's had their worst day, or is going to have their worst day, and it's like, well, that's it. And and how do you overcome that? How do you remember that the light is still there, right? That this thing can't win, and, and uh, this story is going to hopefully help you through it. Yeah, no, I I agree. I th I think you project whatever you need to onto it. And I agree. I think that's sufficient. The, w when we get to Superman beyond, there's this, this book, right. That, that Superman and the rest of them find that contains all other books within it. And, and I believe once again, in that IGN interview, or maybe it's in the story itself, I forget, but there's this notion that that final crisis, right. Is all of the, all of the DC stories or all of the crisis stories right in it. And 
that works. I guess you can interpret that in a couple of ways. But looking at it from a practical standpoint, it really is true. And I think this is the other thing that kind of elevates this a little bit. And you really feel like this is the next level of these types of events because you have a lot of the flavors that were at play not all that long ago in Infinite Crisis, right? When this came out just a couple of years, a couple of years earlier where villains had united in particular, right? And similarly here, you have the secret society under the new leadership of Libra, right? But of course, that ends up being just a small piece of this larger dark side puzzle. And on the note of Libra, that was, I agree with you about not needing to see the battle between Orion and dark side, but Libra, I was always like, what is this guy? Like, what is the deal with this person? Are we supposed to know who this is? They, he's never unmasked in the pages of this. And I was like, what, what is the deal here? And uh, I read the Secret Files issue, and that yeah. recounts the, the backstory. But, but the character had been around previously. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Morrison's got a very specific era of nostalgia, I guess, you know, whenever they were 12 or whatever. And Libra is a holdover from that period of time. Okay. Um, so, yeah, again, I didn't know who Libra was. I... I I looked at that first issue and I was like, oh, it seems like the type of character would have been on the secret society of supervillains before I was born. And yeah, yeah, I think the, the late great Len Wein may have created them. I'm not hundred percent sure about that. And he wrote that secret file story where, okay, then yeah, it was Len Wein. Yeah. 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 Where essentially we find out he was this uh, abused child, you know, came from a, his mother had passed away and his father was an abusive alcoholic and he, was interested in astronomy and he eventually went to Opal University and he was a student of Ted Knight. And he had this whole idea about channeling the power of the stars of the galaxy itself into him. And he had an encounter with the Justice League where he was able to steal half their power, right? This whole idea of balance, right? So it was half that and then eventually half the energy of the galaxy and it, it, you know, warped him. And then he ends up becoming this, as Luther calls him in, in one of the final issues, the glove puppet of of uh of dark side so yeah that's his backstory so he was just a guy right who went on this journey but again my previous readings of this i was always like am i supposed to know who this is is this you know i don't know i didn't know if there was a larger reveal out there there wasn't but at least now i solved that puzzle for myself well i i think that's part of the reason why it's a it's a superhero story that wasn't you know final crisis could have very easily been published as its own thing right graham morrison could have said I'm doing seven issues. I don't want to worry about your continuity. It's This is going to be great. I'm going to let J.G. Jones take their time, and we're going to put it out, and it's going to be bound, and it's going to be beautiful. But they didn't do that. They, they for whatever reason, this thing was published so that it meshed everything together. And I'm sure Morrison was like, oh, man, I never got a chance to use Libra, this character I love who hasn't made a lot of appearances, and now I have this thing. Let me, let me put them in there, uh, which I get, because, again, if I were writing, you know, if I were writing... Batman, every issue would be set in the cauldron. I mean, it's just like at the end of the day, if you're a fan of this, you want to put in what made you a fan in the first place. So yeah, for for me, Libra was always one of those things where it's like, all right, I, I know you're a real character, but I don't think it's necessary to go back and read the Len Wein issues. I trust that Morrison's read them enough. So I agree. I agree. I just got to the, I, my curiosity overtook me. And that, that Secret Files issue was certainly handy. I guess shifting to some of the more nuts and bolts of this, we've hit on a lot of these beats already, but at least initially in this story, we have a few things going on. Like we said, we have Dan Turpin. Well, in the opening pages, even before we get to Turpin, we start at the the beginning of man with Anthro, the first man who Metron visits and gives him the gift of knowledge in the form of fire, right? And of course, we'll revisit Anthro in his final days in the closing pages of the book where he is accompanied by none other than Bruce Wayne, who was not killed by the Omega Sanction, but rather beamed to the distant past, and then he'll have his whole journey in the return of Bruce Wayne. Yes, he will. Which I think was an episode we did. That was part of the okay, yeah, yeah, Morrison yeah, yeah. thing, okay. for sure. But then we have Turpin in the present day. And don't I'm not going to recount the entire plot of this, but just one of the main <laughs> beats to lay it out for people. Although I took, man, I took my notes. I, I read this thing, and then I sat there this afternoon, and I'm typing up notes. I'm like, I, I again, I feel... I feel so good about this story after it, I don't want to say it haunted me, but it was one of those things I always wanted to like it so much more than I actually did. And now I finally do. Anyway, so we have Turpin investigating these missing kids, right? And he, and he, it's during the course of this investigation that he finds the dead body of Orion. 
Uh, but I guess before he actually dies, he makes this this claim that the gods aren't dead; they're 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 in they're in people; they're they're here on Earth. Um, even that whole that whole notion of the of the new gods and the evil gods in particular possessing humans, taking human form, that harkens back to another Morrison work that came before, right? Seven Soldiers of Victory. Doesn't that deal with Boss Darkseid? Isn't he in there? Yeah, yeah. One of the Seven Soldiers is Mister Miracle. Uh, Shiloh Norman and uh, that that four issue miniseries is basically it's basically Final Crisis issue zero because it talks about um, you know Shiloh Norman doesn't get a lot of um, stage time screen presence whatever you want to call it in Final Crisis but they are the most important character because you know when Kirby created the Pantheon if Darkseid is the god of control and Orion's the god of fighting Mr. Miracle is the god of escape uh, and therefore freedom and therefore life and you know it's very telling that Mr. Miracle was the only new God to get his own ongoing book. You know, at the time it was the new gods in general. They share a book, the forever people, which are basically science fiction hippies, uh, Jimmy Olsen, which he inherited because it had no ongoing team and Mr. Miracle. Mr. Miracle is a super escape artist. And in Kirby's mind, it was like, well, he, um, who was raised on apocalypse was raised amidst dark side. He can overcome this. Uh, he will always escape. And, and Morrison codifies that or codifies that, however you pronounce it by saying that the image of his mask, which is just a Kirby glyph, is actually the the life equation. And, you know, if you put it on your body because you're the tattooed man or you're anthro or you're Metron or whatever or else. Or the ray and you put it on the surface of the planet itself. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about, man. The, the, the volume for superhero comics is high. You got to turn it up. And it's like, we got a guy who can go the speed of light. He's going to go the speed of light. You know, we got... We got a printing press in the Fortress of Solitude. You're getting one more issue of the Daily Planet. Like Final Crisis says, every story is canon. Every, every one of them is canon. And they're all going to be needed to stop Darkseid. Because, you know, Darkseid is the anti-monitor crossed with every other threat. You know, you, you need everyone. You need Ultraman. You need weird Nazi Superman. You need everyone because everyone is an example of life of telling a story to someone means we're still alive to do so. And that's what dark side and Mandrake don't want. So you just, you need everything. And I just, I love that because nothing, nothing is left on the table. You know, Aquaman returns, Barry Allen returns, the green lantern core. Ret- this is filled. Every single character gets a great moment. Even if it's just my beloved Martian Manhunter, unfortunately dying. Um, you know, we, we pray for a resurrection. We pray for a resurrection. Yeah, so like we said with Turpin, he finds the body of Orion. This gets the Green Lantern Corps involved investigating the death of a god. We have Jon Stewart who unearths a bullet in the pavement that's been there for 50 years. This whole notion that the bullet was fired backwards through time, which of course we'll later see play out uh, towards the end of the <clears throat> of the miniseries here. We have Jon Stewart attacked and Hal Jordan arrested for Orion's murder and the attack on Jon Stewart. And of course, that's all a setup. And Kraken, one of the Alpha Lanterns, is really granting goodness. Again, there's a ton of stuff at play. Turpin himself, like we said, he finds those kids succumb to the anti-life equation in Boss Darkseid's club, seemingly then forgets that encounter and is in the next issue is beating the crap out of the Mad Hatter because Mad Hatter was creating you know, the mind control devices as he does. Uh, and Turpin's really just relishing in this, the, the violence. He's like really getting off on beating the crap out of Mad Hatter and getting this tip to go to Bloodhaven. And when he gets there and he encounters this evil factory that's been set up at Command D, the gene weapon lab uh, in the remains of Bloodhaven, which had been destroyed uh, during the Infinite Crisis period, uh, that's when we learn that now Darkseid is inhabiting Turpin and over the course of a few issues will break his will and, and take over. Like we said, we have the the Libra side of it, organizing the villains, and uh, we've touched on it already, but in order to show what he's capable of, right, he's here to balance the scales, this whole idea of we always lose because good always triumphs over evil. We're going to upset that order, right? And to prove what he's capable of, he grants the heart's desire of the villain, the human flame, whose nemesis is Martian Manhunter. And it's, again, it plays out so fleetingly in the pages of Final Crisis itself, I am actually glad I read that Peter Tomasi, Doug Monkey, uh, Requiem one shot because it, it it gives Martian Manhunter his due. But as a fan of the, not that I'm not a fan of the character, but I think you're a bigger fan of the character. Yeah, what was your take on that 
on that execute. I mean, it was a very brutal execution, and even more so in the Requiem one shot. You really spend more time in that scene. Yeah, the, Mar- the Martian Manhunter tends to get the the short end of the stick because, for the most part, he never has his ongoing book. So, if there's a you know the the Justice League has seven founding members, and if you want to make uh, a a big impact, you can usually do it using him because you're not going to disrupt anyone else's book. It's it's tough to kill Superman at the beginning of a story or Wonder Woman or Batman uh, because, you know, you're going to need someone else to carry the thing. But unfortunately you can kill the Martian Manhunter. And, you know, I think it accomplished its goal because I remember when the book came out, I wasn't reading it, but I remember everyone had an opinion on the death of Martian Manhunter. It's like, Oh, this was too easy. You killed a, a longstanding superhero for no reason. What is going on? And it's one of those things where, well, yeah, but Morrison accomplished their goal, which was they got you talking about the book, right? They they did that. That was the point. The point, they love the Martian Manhunter. All my favorite, most of my favorite Martian Manhunter stories were written by Grant Morrison in the first place. Like, this is not a character he didn't like. This was a character he lo- they loved. Um, so I, I, I think they accomplished their goal of showing, no, like, evil's winning. This character who shouldn't die just got killed very easily. Like, why is that? And, you know, maybe some people who were angry with that went back and they read the next issue. Um, but yeah, it, it sucks because it's like, uh, it's like an Avengers end game where the, the only two characters who aren't in the final battle are like the vision and the black widow who are instrumental Avengers. Uh, and it's the same thing here. Like when Mandrak shows up at the end, I, even an alternate reality, John Jones would have been nice, you know, throw in the DCAU or Bloodwind or something like that. Uh, and, and that sucked. But, um, like I said, I think, I think Morrison's got enough great stories featuring Martian Manhunter that, uh, it gets made up, but, um, you know, again, we, we pray for resurrection. I, I like that, that line because in the context of the DC universe, it, it makes all the sense in the world. They've yeah, seen really enough does. people come back that. And Superman says it. So, yes. Exactly. Superman is the most notable death in superhero fiction. And he comes back almost immediately. And I, I actually, I read the, the, the death of Superman not too long ago. Uh, excuse me, the, the, the return of Superman. He even says like, did I die? Like th- this is a thing that weighs on him. You know, he is not just like, Oh, we, we come back from the dead. He's like, no, no, wait a second. I, I died. You know, something else happened here. So when he says it, Again, it's Superman. He doesn't say things he doesn't believe in. Like, not only is he saying, like, I hope my friend comes back from the dead, but he's also saying, like, I hope whatever mechanism allowed me to return to my loved ones and to continue doing this job that I love also brings him back because I think he enjoyed this, too. So I do. I love that line because it's another one of these things where, like, Superman believes that. He's not just saying it. It's not just a platitude. It's like, no, I, I came back. I continued to do good I want Jean to come back and continue to do good. So just, I love it. I just love it so much. And they bury him on Mars. Like again, it's, it's spectacle. It's not that he doesn't get buried in Valhalla. He doesn't get buried in, you know, hub city. He gets buried on Mars because that's what the DC superheroes do. They're like, no, we're going to Mars. We're burying our friend next to his, you know, whatever was in continuity at the time, but we're, we're, we're burying him where he'd want to be buried because we can do that. Cause we can go to Mars. Cause that's how big our stories are. Totally. Totally. So, in the pages of Final Crisis itself, he's just sort of dragged into the to the secret society headquarters, and he's on flame, you know, and on you know, uh, on flame. No, that's not right. <laughs> he's, he's on in, fire. In flames. And he's flame. on fire. He's on fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's late, and we've already been going over an hour. <laughs> but uh, you know, and and he and he stabbed. But the Requiem one shot shows you that he put up more of a fight, and he launched this telepathic attack on on the and he had been he had been drugged that was and that was established in final crisis but in the one shot you he wages this telepathic attack to try to buy himself time obviously it doesn't work he's also able to make contact with select members of the justice league and share the history of of his family and his race with them and that is a very poignant moment i have to say though the most brutal aspect of all of this came in that one shot where you find out that they strung him up they strung up his body mm as this, as this symbol of what they were capable of. It was, yeah. yeah, it was, it was really brutal, but thankfully he comes back in blackest night, which I had oh, to, right. yeah, yes. I had to, yeah, yeah. it was one of those things where I was like, well, they know he comes back, but I, for the life of me, I was like, I don't know where or when or how it's a blackest <sighs> night deal. And then he plays a large role in brightest day after that. Oh, that's right. The Bla- blackest night, just, uh, at, at the end, like a dozen yeah. big, 
big top top shelf characters are just magically resurrected, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. That one I blocked out. That one. That one I wouldn't do a, a podcast episode. I was. On. <laughs> this is more for off mic, but you know, like after I remember it was the summer after law school and I I read the entirety of the Jeff Johns Green Lantern run because mm. I had fallen off at some point along the way. And so I read everything and it, I, it like, I really, I know it's a favorite for a lot of people, but it did not do it for me. And the deeper we got into those events and by the time we got to Blackest Night, I was really not feeling it, but it's always one of those things. But over 10 years now, I've always felt like, ah, oh, maybe I'll give it another spin. But in any event, uh, but yeah, so he does eventually come back in, um, in in Blackest Night. So again, these are some of the various threads that are at play here. The death of Orion, the Green Lantern Corps investigation, the, to what of course turns out to be the framing of Hal Jordan. Batman gets taken by Kraken. And then of course later we'll, uh, we'll see him in that device where he's, uh, you know, they're, they're feeding off of his, his uh, emotions and memories and all of that. The death of Martian Manhunter. Eventually, we'll get to this broadcasting of the anti-life equation. We've already mentioned it, but in the midst of all of this, the return of Barry Allen. Now, I, this has come up at various points along the way on the show, and certainly next week, when we talk about Flashpoint, I'll talk about it a lot. <laughs> Look, I, Wally has always been my Flash. He's the Flash I grew up with. Even taking a step back and just sort of looking at it from a narrative standpoint, there's something that's endlessly compelling about the legacy aspect, the fact that, no, this was the protege who made good, who stepped up, who filled the boots and, and really became for our generation, the flash. So, and on top of that, Barry had this magnificent death and continued to pop up here and there through time travel to, through visions, through whatever the case may be as the spirit guide in the speed force. It's not like, Oh, we never saw Barry Allen to me. It was the best of both worlds. We honored the legacy of Barry, but we were moving forward with Wally. So I never clamored for Barry's return. I still have mixed feelings about it, but I gotta say, rereading this, I liked, I liked Barry's role. I liked the fact that Barry came back. There's so much throughout the story where our heroes are against the ropes. And yes, they'll never give up. And of course, Superman, most of all, will, will be that, that noble shining beacon, right? And has a number of, of key moments with his whistling, with his miracle machine, <laughs> right? With, with all of it, with being able to contain the bleed from the orrery of worlds in his mouth and pass it to Lois and bring her back. All great stuff. And as a Superman fan, I'm there for all of that. But otherwise, I think the, the DC, in, in this story, they needed an injection of that hope. And Barry Allen's crackling lightning, as much as I've made jokes about that in previous episodes, I feel like it really counts for something. And when he finds Iris and she has watched the anti-life broadcast on the television and she has succumbed to it and his kiss and the little electricity that passes between them snaps her out of it. I say to myself, okay, regardless of what comes after and Wally being pushed to the side and all that stuff <laughs> in the context of this, I liked it a lot. What about you? What does he say in new frontier? You don't mess with my Iris. Don't ever mess with my Iris. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Prior to this, I mean, I would say, well, honestly, even still, that's probably still my favorite version of Barry and my favorite. And more than anything, especially at that point in time, because I hadn't read many Barry stories, yeah. right? So that... Well, New Frontier is, is a flawless work. I, is. I would say I would say New Frontier and Final Crisis are neck and neck for, for my favorite DC events. Um, but I mean... Uh, uh, final um, excuse me new frontier has the benefit of, of a single voice right it's just it's it's darwin cook writing drawing even working on the animated adaptation so it's different no crossovers no, no i mean it's just that's it it's uh, yeah no i mean I, I always say it's a crossover because if you were reading comics in the mid 50s you would probably be, be like oh, wait, wait challengers of the unknown or meeting the losers that's actually pretty cool uh but but to go back to this yeah i i, I have no nostalgia for barry but i I liked when he showed up because um, it's a crisis, right? So a flash has to play a pivotal role. And what, what I liked about it is that he shows up and he's out racing death, right? He's, he's li literally the fourth world has a grim reaper. It's named the black racer and it's, he's out racing it. And, and to your point, it is, it's that hope moment of no, 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 he hasn't caught me yet and he's not going to catch me. And now I've gotten the rest of you on board and we're going to do this. You know, Barry is also a God in, in the way that, you know, he's, he's Hermes, he's Mercury, he's, 
he's he's thought he's living lightning. So when he he kisses Iris, he's literally passing that knowledge, that that life, that like that. You know, Morrison always talks about how important the flash iconography is, and it's 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 entombed there. Now, I don't have any nostalgia for the character, so whatever happens to him after this, I know he becomes the main Flash again, you know, whatever. But I, I did like it here, where it's like in your deepest, darkest moment, the, the living lightning bolt, the character that began the Silver Age, the original, well, whatever Flash he is, and he shows up and 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 he helps save the day. Now, if he had just retired with Iris and and, and moved on, that would have been fine too. But, I, but again, I, I like the idea that with Final Crisis, every if the bad guys get to break every rule to win, the good guys get to break every rule to stop them. Right. They, they even say one of my favorite lines in this book is the Superman of the multiverse is a team so powerful and so complicated. It can only be called together once. And when captain Marvel is leading all the various versions of Superman themselves, thinly veiled versions of thinly veiled versions of Superman controlled by other companies it's one of those things where it's like, yes, good. Everything is on the table. We're leaving it all on the field because this is the final story, even though we know to be continued. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have to say, with the exception of the Superman moments that we've been that we've been alluding to and discussing, the the flash moments are the ones that stand out to me the most when when Wally and Jay recognize that something's going on and Jay is the first one to clock the the frequency, Barry's vibrational frequency. And he just has that moment of realization and disbelief. And you see Barry racing toward them and racing towards us with, like you said, the black racer hot on his trail and the run. Yeah. And I appreciate more, you know, I appreciate Morrison's restraint because from a fan service perspective, I think it would have been really easy to like immediately dive into a heart to heart between Wally and Barry, but that doesn't happen for a good couple of issues. Yeah. And when it does happen, it's just such a small moment. But when Wally says, you were dead, we never got over it. It just, ah, man, it, it really hits me. And then later on in the story, when Barry's talking about how, you know, I, I have this, I have this plan, right? I know what I need to do, but the black racer is not going to, not going to stop coming for me. And Wally's like, I faced him once when he was the black flash, I outran him. Yeah. And that's, of course, harkens back to the Grant Morrison, Mark Miller run on, on The Flash when they wrote it for a year. Yeah. Uh, and Barry's response where he smiles, he's like, I bet you did. Just the pride of like, yeah, you you are my protege, my, yeah. you know, my, my, ne or my nephew, and you, you surpassed me, right? It's yeah. everything that you would and should want for someone in that capacity. And it was such a beautiful moment. And the kiss with Iris when he snaps her out of it and when he says, I'm sorry I'm late, right? Uh, which, again, just a hallmark of the character always being late and... And Iris, Iris in that moment saying, everything's going to be okay, isn't it? It's like he has that, that effect on people. And then while we're on, while we're talking about the flashes, I love, I love the role that the two of them, Wally and Barry end up playing. And, and also Wally sticking with Barry, because there's yeah. a point where he's like, I, you know, I'm not letting you do this alone. Like we do this together. But the idea that they are going to race toward Darkseid and lead the black racer to Darkseid, who is there for the dying gods right to claim them and at that point he's been shot by batman and is ready to be claimed uh so not only are they going to bring the black racer to dark side but they are going to save superman from the omega beams by yep. drawing them away so they serve a vitally <laughs> critical function in the story and they do it together and yeah man i what's funny too is we don't even get an explanation for why barry's back in this oh yeah i I don't think this is canon and I can picture the George Perez page in crisis and infinite earths where Barry deteriorates. But in my mind, I had just assumed like, Oh, you, you've been running since 1985. <laughs> like you've just been, you've just been running through the multiverse, through every reconstruction, through everything else. That's probably not the case. I'm sure Jeff Johns has a much more detailed reason that explains every single inconsistency. But to me, it was like, Oh no, you just, you've been running. You, you know, you, 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 you began this multiverse when you named yourself the flash because you read a Jay Garrick comic and then you met Jay Garrick and that's that. And you can draw a straight line from the two of them running to save that construction worker to final crisis, to every story to come afterwards. It's a straight line. 
Um, so you, you kind of needed that moment to not only to pay homage, but to remind people like this started because two guys who liked each other, you know, wanted to, wanted to help save the world. And now, now it's this, now it's this giant thing and you've all tuned in for it. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I like that Morrison gives everyone their due to go back to that green arrow scene. Green Arrow's not in this a lot, but the one time he is, he gets a good moment because Morrison's like, no, if all these characters are important. Green Arrow is someone's favorite character. And if I'm going to have them here, I'm going to have a due moment. And Morrison does this great thing where he always figures out what the character's voice is. Like, even if he doesn't necessarily like them, he's like, no, what is, what, what is the moment? What would Ollie say? And who would he say it to? Oh, he would say this, you know, he, right here, this is what he would do. And it's the same thing with Barry. It's like, what's Barry going to do? He wants to see how Wally's doing. He wants to check in on Iris and he wants to run next to Jay. Like those are key moments and Morrison nails them and Morrison moves on, doesn't waste any more space. And it's the same thing with Superman. It's like, why would Superman, you know, risk everything? Lois got hurt, like full stop. Like that makes sense to me. It's like, oh yeah, of course he's going to go on his hero's journey because Lois got hurt. So Yes. And well, that's a perfect segue. So again, we've been talking about Again, this one track, this one level that the story is operating on. Dark side on Earth, broadcasting the anti-life equation. The people of Earth, the heroes of Earth, Wonder Woman, Mary Marvel, Black Lightning, succumbing to anti-life, battling it out in Bloodhaven in the wasteland that is Bloodhaven. The remaining freedom fighters, Ollie and Dinah and the others, uh, and the various watchtowers across the Earth, the Daily Planet, Printing Press and the Fortress of Solitude, all of all of that business, the return of Barry. But then there is this whole other piece, and we've been touching on it, but to get into it more specifically here. So it's in the first issue of Final Crisis that we get in this story our first glimpse of the orrery of worlds, right? And the monitors who watch the multiverse. So this superstructure that contains all of the 52 Earths of the multiverse, right? And this substance like something suspended in in a solution as they describe it right this substance the bleed that uh is, is there in this in this structure between all of the earths um in the multiverse and again the monitors who watch them and one in particular nix wotan is that how we're saying it yeah that sounds right Wot wotan wotan i i find i find all the monitor names to be ridiculous uh, morrison said each one is supposed to be based on before i described how every you know, pantheon in the ancient world, they all had similar characteristics. And this is, this is every, everyone's got a God of knowledge, right? So, so Wotan is, Odin is the God of knowledge of the, the Asgardians. It's the same thing. One of them is called Thought. One of them is called Hermes. It's, it's, but, but it's, it's made into a science fiction name. It's what, it's what Kirby would do, right? Kirby's like, well, I want to call that character Cersei, or I want to call it Ma uh, Mercury, but I'm going to spell it a different way. I'm going to jazz it up and make it a little sci-fi. But yeah, it's in, in, in Nick's Wotan. Yeah, I guess that makes as much sense as anything. The next time we see the character, he's just calling himself Super Judge, which I love. Yeah. <laughs> but he is punished and exiled for failing to protect Earth-51 from destruction. It's now become this graveyard, this graveyard world. But... Now, again, I know we didn't, neither of us read uh, Countdown to Final Crisis, but uh, having just reread, not reread, having first read uh, 52 very recently, that's where we learn that this new multiverse has been born consisting of 52 Earths. And we see in uh, the Booster Gold battle with, with Mr. Mind how all of these different Earths changed. They were originally these identical copies to New Earth, and now they're different ones, and we have 52. I, I mean, I, I don't know offhand. I, I, I suspect we had seen this race of monitors maybe in the Countdown to Final Crisis miniseries. I, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. But in any event, in this story, in that first issue, this is the first glimpse. And, it, you know, at this point in the story, it feels, this part feels accessible, right? We've dealt with, with the monitor before in Crisis on Infinite Earth. This idea of like, okay, there are these other beings out there who are, and we're familiar on the Marvel side with, with Watcher. Like, right, that that concept I think is pretty is pretty digestible. And and there is this talk, even in that that first appearance in issue number one here, about uh, long story short, I guess, the the influence of these worlds on the race of monitors, that they have narratives they have histories identities loves right that they've experienced as a result of watching and and having this experience with the the multiverse in their care essentially 
but it gets far more uh, <laughs> complicated as we're moving forward, but that's sort of our initial glimpse of them. But then, as you were mentioning a moment ago, we have a uh, bombing at the Daily Planet, right? That is Lieber's way of convincing Luther to join the cause here. And, oh, just as a quick side note, of course, Lieber has the crime Bible. We talked about that a lot in the 52 episode and the religion of crime. So it was nice to see that connection point. So there's this bombing at the Daily Planet. Lois is injured and Clark is in the hospital with her. And it's only his infrared massage that he's giving her with his heat vision that is keeping her heart beating. Uh, the, the shrapnel that had been in it and the damage that was done. And then one of the monitors, Zillow Walla, is that, is that it? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, that we'll go right. with that. Uh, she shows up and offers to save Lois, to give Clark the one thing that he wants in exchange for his help. And that's the tee up for the Superman Beyond two-parter and this much larger picture that we get and I'm just going to toss it to you. Do you, I mean, do you, <laughs> as much as I, at this point now, I, I feel like I do have a good understanding of it, but you have been reading and studying and discussing this for so long. So I guess, let me toss it to you. What, what do we learn about the nature of the multiverse and this, and this over void uh, over the course of Superman beyond? Yeah. I mean, uh, you hit on the most important thing, which is, you know, the Monitor was a character created by Marv Wolfman. It was very important in the original Crisis on Infinite Earths. Um, this story just says, okay, well, what if time has gone on and enough things have changed that one Monitor has become many Monitors and now they have their own mythology? And, and it's this relationship between what they call the flaw, which is just uh, life, things that change, things that are capable of changing, and things that are incapable of changing, which is what they thought they were. Um, and then they have these mythologies as they base, um, off each other. Uh, but they're, they're both suffering from that. They don't know how to deal with that because they're, they're not used to this. Uh, it's like, I always give the example of if a human being had to suddenly talk to all the bacteria that lived in its body, you, you wouldn't know what to do with that. You'd be like, well, I don't understand how we could have a relationship um, that's not a great analogy because it's ridiculous, but it's, it's, no, it's, it's perfect because they refer to the, the world in the multiverse as the germ world. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. That's where I took that from. Okay. Sure. 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 So, um, and then the, the other thing I just want to point out is it's, it's called the bleed, um, because it was, it was created by Warren Ellis, uh, for the book, the authority. And the idea is that the bleed is the part of the comics book, uh, comic page that runs to the end. <laughs> So when, when, <laughs> when, when Warren Ellis created it, he was saying, I want the authority, which is basically a version of the justice league that doesn't have a, a compuncture, um, uh, anything against killing. They went to different worlds. They were a multiverse story and, and they would go through the bleed, but he was just saying, well, yeah, they're going from one comic to the other. They're going from one panel to the other. That's why it's called the bleed. Morrison made it a bit more specific uh and and even says well that's why the skies turn red during a crisis because of the bleed the space between worlds is is leaking in so morrison went in a very interesting direction for that um but yeah to to me superman beyond is superman is given a hero's quest right he ha he has to save lois lane full stop that 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 that's his thing um but to do that he has to be exposed to every side of what it means to be Superman, right? All the other characters in the book are the characters that were created in real life over the decades when someone looked at Superman and said, well, how can I do a version of that? He meets Captain Marvel. And I mean Captain Marvel. And I don't mean Shazam. I don't mean any of the updated versions. This is a version that's never met Superman before. He walked right out of the 40s. He's Billy Batson. He's ready to go. He's hopeful. But he also meets Overman, a version of him where, it, you know, the rocket crashed in occupied Germany and is raised by Hitler. He, he, he meets uh, Captain Adam, who is the quality character who becomes Dr. Manhattan. He meets all these different versions of himself. I think Morrison described it as, you know, what happens when you pass the idea of Superman through a prism, right? You get all the different colors of light, but it's the same idea. And, uh, you know, it doesn't stop there. It's like, okay, we have all the different versions of Superman and you want to save Lois what does that mean? <laughs> that means that, uh, you know, well, what does the monitor want? Well, the monitor wants this relationship to continue. They want life to continue. They want everything to continue. Uh, and that means she's basically tricked him into fighting Mandrak. 
And during the course of the two issues, they go to limbo, which I, I love uh, because, it, again, it's it's this idea of, all right, you're Superman. You've been in constant publications since 1938. You were, you inspired an entire genre. You you kept the medium alive. Uh, you, you've been in every uh, form of communication we have a name for. This is limbo. This is the opposite of that. Every character we've ever forgotten about, every dream you woke up from before you could fully crystallize in your mind, it's here. It's limbo. This is a place where ideas and stories go to die when people stop telling them. Uh, and, and, you know, he meets a bunch of obscure DC characters and Morrison's used limbo before, most famously in Animal Man. Uh, but I, I love it because when Superman arrives there, the, 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 the king of limbo, this old character, I think they're a real character called Merry Man, basically says, well, you're doing something in limbo. You can't do something in limbo. That's not allowed. And Superman's like, no, we're here. We're going to get out of this. And he's able to inspire even the forgotten characters, the forgotten stories and everything else. It's, it's this idea of every aspect of the DCU needs to be um, brought to attention and weaponized if we're going to stop Mandrak. And of course, the way he can fight Mandrak, because only Superman can do this, is over the course of the two issues, the Dr. Manhattan character, um, Captain Adam, which was the character's original name before Watchmen, um, that's an oversimplification, finally realizes how they're going to fight an unstoppable vampire god. And and my favorite scene, possibly in all of DC comics, is when he picks up Superman and he picks up Ultraman, who is the 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 the, the ultimate evil Superman. He comes from a world where evil and villainy and malice will always win. That's the rule. That's the rule as written down by the creators. And uh, he smashes them together. And he says, um, you know, they're the, the divide, the things that divide us as living creatures are false. They're fake. They're not real. And this is a huge theme in all of Morrison's um, creator own work, especially in the invisibles. And he says to Superman, he says, you know, um, noble act. And he says to Ultraman, hate crime. And then he smashes them together. And when he does that, uh, they wake up in the overvoid. They wake up in monitor space. And Superman is in this suit of armor and there's a bunch of stuff. But basically the idea is the Superman idea is so good. It, we, we did such a good thing as a species coming up with this that only he can fight Mandrak. And in that moment where he's He's been combined with his evil, malicious, control-driven, vampire, crazy person of an alternate reality, which is no less Superman than he is. Together, they can fight this thing. And it's it's a great fight between him and Mandrak, because Mandrak just wants to eat and consume and destroy and unmake. He, he's, he's the void. Um, he's the eraser on the pencil. Um, and Superman says, I'm not going to be able to beat you. And then he says, wait, I hear another voice. I hear Ultraman. And Ultraman is saying to him, I know this guy. This is the worst attributes. I have those attributes. You wouldn't have been able to beat him because you can't see things from my perspective. I can. And together, they overpower Mandrak. He gets thrown down into the germ worlds to respond later. And this entire time they've been asking Superman, they say, if you fail and you can't do this thing, we know you will, but if you can't, we have to ask, what do you want on your tombstone? And he responds with such a great scene. And it just says to be continued because that's the point. You can call this final crisis. You can say it's the end. You can say, this is it. There's going to be no more stories after this, but there is. And if we've done our job, you're going to be talking about this story. We are talking about this story. Uh, so every, every good story of this type to be continued, because there'll always be another one. Someone will always need saving and Superman will always be there. And if it's not Superman, it'll be some other version of the character. It'll be Shazam. It'll be John Kent. It'll be Samaritan. It'll be Supreme. It'll be someone else that this character is inspired because he's such a good idea and a good idea finds a way to continue. And that's the point of the Ori of Worlds. And I can, I can talk the next hour about this, but th those are the big points that I, I love about Superman Beyond. No, thank you so much for laying all of that out. I loved, I loved hearing your take on all of that. And yeah, this idea is undeniable. It's everlasting. And just as the character's battle is never ending, right? Similarly, these stories will continue to be published and discussed and all of that. And one of the things, again, not to, not to only just keep going back to that interview, but one of the things Morrison talked about was how powerful stories are and how 
real stories are when you wear a Superman shirt as you're wearing one now. He, Morrison used the Batman example in the interview, but like when you wear the shirt, when you derive some measure of inspiration, when you think about how you want to act in a certain situation and you think about what your favorite character might do, all of this time that we spend reading and thinking and talking about this, there's, no, they're not flesh and blood in front of us, but there is something very real about the meaning that we derive from them. And so this idea that with within this fictional world that we're talking about, that the, you know, the stories that we've been reading exist essentially, I guess, in a way as stories to these monitors and have influenced them. Yeah, there's something really powerful about that. And Morrison also talked about the, equated it to if the, and I think, I think you had even said this earlier too, like if the blank page didn't like what was being <laughs> written and drawn on it. And when Superman is in the, in the uh, Earth 51 library and he's reading this book that contains all books and we're given the quote unquote previously, right? And we see how all of this came to be that we started with this white, this empty space, this conscious overvoid that detected this flaw, right? That again was, was, was life, was the multiverse, and you had the, 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 this consciousness, the overvoid, sent a probe, right, at the first monitor, right, I suppose? Oh, yeah, 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 I, sure. In the, in the context of the story, yeah, fine, that's the origin of, of the monitor. But really what it is is a, a, a child read the first comic, a child yeah, read the yeah, first yeah. story. A, a, a someone looked at this thing, the overvoid is the reader who doesn't read or doesn't know or doesn't care, you know, is a blank slate and the flaw is fiction. The flaw is the first time that you hear a story or are told a story or consume something that changes you because immediately the overvoid is like, well, I got to know more about this. And yeah, fine. It sends the monitor in, but by the time the monitor comes back, the overvoid is not there anymore. There's all this stuff, this things, things exist, things are created. Um, this self-assembling hyper story, right? So now this yeah. whole history of the monitors has evolved. Yeah. And the remnant of that first foray into the multiverse and, and witnessing their first story, reading their first comic, seeing Superman and the others in action is the Superman statue that they all look at and don't know what to make of. And that's what that merged Superman, Ultraman energy inhabits. It's again, I, you know, I've read this multiple times. It was the first time where I was like, no, this is really, really cool. And of course I, I thought of you and I thought of all-star Superman with the whole, again, noble act and, you know, me hate crime. Cause again, we have that whole bit in all-star Superman with what happens when the unstoppable force meets the immovable object that it definitely called, called that to mind. As yeah. Well. And, and the other scene in, in all-star that I, I always go back to is in issue 10 where, um, uh, uh, they in that issue they talk about a world with no superhumans. It's called uh, I think Universe Q or something like that. Uh, and you you see at the end of that issue that in a world with no superhumans and thus no Superman, you see Siegel and Schuster creating Superman as a fictional character. And, and I always read that as more as in saying, well, listen, our our world, the world of the reader, the world of you and I, we we don't have superhumans, but in a way we do because we have Superman, and and he tells us how he would behave if he had ultimate power. And that is his way of interacting with us. And his effect on the world is very, I'm surrounded by him as I'm saying this. And it's a very powerful <laughs> thing because it's, it's a good idea. It's like, this guy is all powerful and he's all good. Right. To quote, <laughs> to quote uh, uh, Snyder. So it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a way of, of, of acknowledging the power fiction has over your own life, especially comic book fans who are, and I'm speaking for myself, you know, we are, we are religious in a lot of ways, you know, we're meticulous and, 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 and that's yielded a lot of good, uh, for me. A lot, a lot of my friends I've met, most of my friends I've met through this hobby, but it also like, you know, you, 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 you lose yourself in this nonsense. You have to remember the rest of the world exists. And, um, I, I think that, that, that's part of that story of like, the monitors get obsessed with the stories they're reading and the stories they're consuming. And it ultimately kind of destroys them. Um, but, uh, you know, they also acknowledge the power it has over them and it helps them defeat the ultimate evil and it allows things to continue on. So again, it's, they're called vampires, but it's really this like, watch what you consume, what you get out of it and why you like it in the first place. And I, I just feel like that's the point of, of Superman Beyond. So, 
of course, in the, while we're discussing Superman Beyond, we mentioned the Ultraman character. So one of the other things that you and I read, and I know we, we haven't had as much time to talk about it as I originally <laughs> intended, but we've had so much ground to cover. But the Earth 2 original graphic novel by Grant Morrison and Frank Quitely from 2000. Yeah. This is an old one now. But we took a look at that. And now certainly Ultraman and the rest of the crime syndicate, they had existed in pre-crisis continuity on Earth 3. We talked about it when we did our Crisis on Multiple Earths episode for Chapter 1 of Red Skies. But this was, unless I'm mistaken, their return to action in post-crisis continuity. And the, I think the main reason why I wanted to include this here as part of this event is that we've had all of this talk about consolidating a multiverse and bringing a multiverse back and this and that. And it's like that graphic novel came out at a time where there was just a single universe in DC continuity. Yet Morrison found a way to spin this tale about an alternate earth with this twisted version of the justice league that in this world is the crime syndicate. So it was interesting to me on that level. And then certainly of course, seeing the role that Ultraman played here I mean, I remember reading it when it came out. I don't know that I've ever really gone back to it because as I was reading it, well, I had next to no memory of it. I'm like, <laughs> I know I read it at the time, but I remember barely anything about it. I texted you. I was like, I feel like for Morrison, it was fairly light. And I know you were like, no, I think I think it's pretty dense. They just don't use a, maybe they let the art breathe a little bit more with Quietly in particular. But I don't know. I found, I mean, compared to Final Crisis, this was a downright breezy read. Yeah. But let me just toss it to you. What your your takeaways from Earth Two, especially as they relate to Final Crisis? Yeah. Um. My my thing with Morrison is when they're working with Frank Quietly, it does tend to be like that. It tends to be a little bit more effortless. I think that's one of the reasons why, if you ask nine out of ten people, it's like, "What's your favorite Grant Morrison story?" Oh, it's probably All Star Superman, or, or you know, in in general, it's like. It's Flex Mentallo, it's We Three, it's Pax Americana, it's C for Extinction. When the two of them work together, and again, they're from the same town, they've known each other, they they must, I've never met Frank Wiley, but they, they must have shorthand that's like me talking to you. I mean, it's just like that. So when they're together, it's it's something new. It, it really is. It's it, it comes across as effortless. I'm sure it's not. Um, but Earth 2 is a great example of that because you can give it to almost anyone. And the ideas aren't conveyed through walls of text they're conveyed just through beautiful art and uh art that you know this is one of those books where if you took all the dialogue out i would still read it because i think quietly does such a good job at conveying the story probably because he spoke to grant and they went through it and they discussed it and he was probably like oh yeah i get exactly what you're going for and just bam you know hit hit print um but the the thing i like most about earth too as it uh, relates to Final Crisis is Earth 2 is the first time that I remember reading a story about um, S Superman has to lose to win. And that's that's the big takeaway from Earth 2. You know, Earth 2 is a story about a world that is the opposite. And that doesn't just mean like everyone's bad. It means, you know, if you're reading a Superman story in action comics, he's going to win. That's the nature of the fictional world that's been established through decades of publishing. Superman is going to win. Uh, and if he doesn't win, it's probably going to be an imaginary story and else will. So there's a mechanism for that. Um, Earth 2 is about a world where the evil must triumph because that's their rules. And their rules are just as strong as Superman's rules because, again, they are inversions of each other. You know, Superman goes to, to well, <laughs> technically, uh, our Earth is Earth Two, <laughs> and yeah. uh, Earth, the original Earth, Earth One, is the uh, the antimatter universe. But not, not, none of that matters. It's it's just great to see the Superman and his friends in the Justice League go to a world and do what they do. You know, they they put in the hours, they try to fix things, and uh, you know, Batman, especially in this era of 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 his um of of his career, is constantly saying things like, "I don't know about this. I don't know about this," and he gets distracted by a, a personal matter. Um, but once he realizes what's going on, it hits you like a, like a punch to the gut. It's like, no, you, you can't win here. You have to lose. You have to be comfortable with that. And that's the only way you're going to be able to go home. Um, and the crime syndicate actually gets kind of like a, they are the ones who save all of existence because they're the only ones who can, uh, triumph in a world where evil must win. So 
to, that was a big thing to me because I had never seen that type of storytelling before. And I had to read this a few times to really get it. But again, once, once I got it, like the, the, the version that I read that I have with me today is actually a first edition just because I like the art so much. Um, and I, I thought that was great. And I think Final Crisis, just as it expands on Kirby's fourth world and Rock of Ages and so many other things that Morrison's done, the Earth 2, that idea is is fundamental because, like I said, you know, both of those have to come together to defeat Mandrake because they both represent different aspects of there being something as opposed to nothing. And again, I could talk about this forever, but but I do think Earth 2 is is a good setup for that. But it's also an amazing story on its own. Uh, before we were talking about Martian Manhunter, there is a great, great Martian Manhunter scene. It's just one page. It's not a big arc, but it's just, uh, you know, Martian Manhunter is as strong as Superman. He gets left on our world so that he can defend it in case anything goes wrong. And of course it does. And he has to fight the crime syndicate on his own. And he, he does pretty well. And it's one of those things where like we were talking about the flash, like Morrison's not telling a Martian Manhunter story, but if they're going to use the character, they're going to use the character well. And it's just one of those things where I've, I've again, I've, I've scanned it. I've sent it to people. I'm like, this is why I like this random, random green skinned character from the fifties scenes like this. No, right on. No, I mean, overall I enjoyed it. And yes, I, I, I had forgotten, right, what Earth 2 actually refers to. So yeah, it's a, the heroic Alexander Luther of the antimatter universe escapes here. And he's talking about how I didn't know what to what to call this Earth. I settled on Earth 2. So yes, technically our Earth is the Earth 2 in this context. <laughs> but um, I, I guess, not to Monday morning quarterback this and who am I to tell Grant Morrison, but I felt like the whole sequence where our Justice League is in the antimatter universe and they are trying to set things right felt like that was the path to could have been the path to an interesting story how do they go about that does it go as smoothly as as they might think what sort of resistance do they encounter uh i was also struck by the thomas wayne right being alive in this world and in this and so in this world uh he's tom right and the son thomas is owl man and they survived the mugging but martha and bruce were killed right was it bruce like bruce had yeah oh yeah yeah uh, so again, just kind of knowing what we would eventually get with Flashpoint and that whole world and the Thomas Wayne Batman, it was just, it was just kind of interesting to see that. And and yeah, like you said, this idea that the way to win in this case is for them to lose because the Justice League would never abandon a world in the midst of a crisis, but here they have to, yeah, right, uh, because this is not a world set up for their for them to win. So yeah. for good to win. So yeah, no, it was it was cool. It's definitely worth a read, uh, and especially you know, hand in hand with this. So if anyone hasn't read it, I would definitely say, give it a read. It's quick too. It's, um, it's an OGN, but it's, it's, I don't know, it's like 90 it's, pages. Yeah, it's, it's really, it goes by quickly. And again, for, for Morrison. And so it's funny, not, not to, not to harp on this whole thing about how incomprehensible or not final <laughs> crisis is. But when we were taking a break, Mike and I were talking and I, I was saying how in fairness to audience members who, who were frustrated with final crisis, if you look at something like Earth 2, or just generally speaking, Morrison's JLA run, I don't think you would be out of line in expecting something in that vein, especially for this line-wide crisis-level DC event. And so I think that probably, I know for myself it did, you go in with certain expectations and then you find this is a very different kind of story. And for people who kind of wrote it off after an initial reading, or maybe you didn't even make it to the end, I'm sure you have one very specific impression of what Final Crisis is. <laughs> As Mike and I are talking about, we've like wrestled with this material for I mean, you far more than I have. But with for both of us, you know, we've wrestled with it now for, for 15 years <laughs> and yeah. multiple readings and discussions. And and again, you might not want to invest that level of work and that's fine. But, you know, but again, I can understand why people might be like, all right, it's Morrison. It's a JLA, like this is a, a crisis event. You have a certain expectation of what it's going to be. And, the, and this story is not that. Final Crisis is not that, in fairness. I I, uh, I think that's a really good point because I, I often meet people who were like, well, JLA was great. I don't understand why I can't get through this. And I, I don't know if this is fair, but I always think, well, yeah, when, when Morrison was doing JLA, they had an editor. And they had, you know, they had people standing over them and saying, well, no, this has to sell a certain way. And you can't use Hawkman. Hawkman's not in continuity. All right, I'm going to create an angel character. You can't use Ollie. You know, you, there, there was restriction. And, and you know, art is often defined 
by restrictions and by collaborators and by the other very uh, tactile limits that's placed on it. Final Crisis has almost no limits because, like I said before, at that point, you know, Morrison between 52, the Batman run, there's this, there's their status in the industry in general. And the fact that they were the, I don't know what you would call it, the head curator of the one year later thing, like they were defining the DC universe writ large. Final Crisis isn't just one person, you know, being told like, hey, you got to do a summer crossover. It's them saying, what do you got? And Morrison coming back with, well, I'm happy you asked because, and it's a sequel to the fourth world. It's a story about stories. It's a, you know, it's a Superman story I've always wanted to tell. It's also a sequel to every other comic Grant Morrison has ever written for DC Comics going back to, you know, their very first one. Um, so there's a lot and it doesn't have the limits or the constraints that JLA would have. Um, certainly I've met many more people who enjoy rock of ages or a new world order or one of those things, which is a more straightforward superhero story. Uh, and I, I'm glad we can talk about those too, but final crisis is just on a different level. And maybe that's because it's a crisis. Maybe that's just like, Hey, you, you put that, you put that name in the title, you put that word in there and it's like, well, no, I got to give you something you haven't seen before. Yeah, I mean, it's like if you sneak it in as a subtitle, eh, people will let you slide a little bit more. But you put that in the title, in the main title, you got to, there. I think you got to deliver something. And I, I believe Morrison did. This is probably more of an off-mic question, but did you, have you read Metal or and or Death Metal? Uh, no. Okay, no. Uh, so we'll be covering that in, in upcoming episodes. And again, mostly everything that we've been covering in this event, it's a reread for me, with some exception. Metal and death metal I'll be reading for the first time. And let me just say, I guess you're a good person to say this to because I know how much <laughs> you love Morrison. And and audience, you might totally disagree. And I might end up disagreeing with myself when I actually read these stories. But I'm a little nervous is too strong a word. But I'm a little, <laughs> I have some mixed feelings about Scott Snyder and metal and death metal. I have not really read enough Scott Snyder to have a fully formed opinion of his work, honestly. But... I guess the impression that I have is that he's, and with those events in particular, aiming for kind of a Morrison thing, but I don't know, what Grant Morrison does is very specific, and I'm willing to spend the time with Morrison because, especially for the rereads that I've done over these past few years, I feel like it's been worth it and I've really gotten something out of it. And so I guess I... I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if I'll feel the same way with Scott Snyder. Like, again, I just have this feeling that he's going for this Morrison-esque vibe or style or whatever you want to call it, but does he have the tools that Morrison does and, and will it feel as worth it? Again, I'm saying this really from a, an ignorant place, really just kind of the sense that I've gotten. So I'll, I'll have a better answer in a couple of episodes, but I just wanted to ask you. I, I have not read a lot of Scott Snyder, though he is local. Uh, my understanding is he did or does teach at Sarah Lawrence, uh, which is a local school in our area. Um, I uh, I agree. I think he's definitely a Morrison fan, and I think that's awesome. I will I will share a very quick story. Uh, our mutual friend George Christinez was interviewing him at an event I was in attendance for once, and he talked about how... Um, you know, the DC cosmology has this idea of the source wall, which is basically the barrier that separates fiction from nonfiction, whatever. And my understanding is in metal, that wall gets broken or whatever. And Scott Snyder said that Grant Morrison said, you know what you should do at the end that no one will expect. It'll make it the highest selling book of the year. When the source wall cracks open, you should have the reader turn to the last page and running at, at them and the characters at full speed, just the silver surfer. Just Jack Kirby's most, most pure creation. And Snyder's like, well, how would I possibly get away with that? Morrison's like, no, 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 I can't answer that question. But that is absolutely what you should do. I, th I think I'm telling that story correctly. It was a couple of years ago. And I always I always think of, you know, you mentioned Snyder and Morrison in the same breath. It's like, if you're getting recommendations like that from this person who's already a legend by the time you're writing, you know, arguably the premier book, um, then, then yeah, I, I, I imagine that some of some of uh, what made Morrison household name probably rubbed off on Snyder. So. 
Yeah. So look, I go in with an open mind. I, again, there's just a little bit of, of wariness, but hopefully those fears will be dashed as soon as I get into it or not. Either way, we'll have some interesting episodes. Well, if nothing else, you're going to have the great uh, Greg Capullo on art. And yeah. I am a huge, huge fan of his. So Randomly, I think I have Scott Snyder's phone number. Uh, you, I'm sure you know the story where our mutual friend, Sean McInerney, you know, he and I worked at our local comic shop, Alternate Realities, for many years. And one Saturday, which is the day that Sean worked, there was a call... Uh, on the on the phone and the caller ID said Scott Snyder and like you said we know he's local and I don't remember the specifics of the call as Sean related them but they were I don't think he flat out said I'm Scott Snyder comic book writer but the substance of the conversation was such that Sean felt reasonably confident that that was the Scott Snyder and copied down his phone number from the caller ID and he also I asked for it I guess so I've, I've never used it in all these years and I, I wouldn't <laughs> but randomly in any event following our Superman now through the end of Final Crisis here. So we've had this whole Superman Beyond Adventure. And again, issues four and five of Final Crisis, we have, we're really seeing the ravages of the anti-life equation and, and more battles between our holdouts and the, the forces of dark side. And in the interest of time, I'll leave the readers to, or the audience members, to, uh, you know, to, to, to read it and, and fill in any, any blanks here. But we see Superman again, at the start of issue six with Brainiac five in the future. And he's clearly had this whole Legion of three worlds adventure in the interim, which again, we are going to cover that next year on the podcast. Again, it just felt so, so separate from final crisis. Uh, that was another thing we were talking about off mic in the, uh, kind of the, the, the thought process behind branding it as such when it really was its own thing. But in any event, that's when we circle back with Superman and, Brainiac 5 is telling him about this, this miracle machine, this device that the controllers built in the future that was based on the, the Guardians of the Universe and the Green Lantern willpower energy, this machine that can, call, that can turn thought into reality and create anything, uh, which I guess really ties in, even going back to the very beginning of this with Metron and the fire and the, the uh, explanation that we get at the very end about what fire is able to... Uh, you know, you, you think things and I guess fire enables you to, in its various forms, enables you to bring it to life, that kind of idea. Yeah, I just took it as um, uh, 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 when you when you give when you when you tell someone a story, you're giving them information. Right. And in Metron's case, it's like, well, you're you're anthro. You're the first boy. You're the first Cro-Magnon. I'm going to tell you how to create fire. And then you see uh, anthro immediately use that like a superpower to repel Vandal Savage, the worst supervillain in, in, in DC's uh, Earth history. And then, you know, later on, uh, when we see Bruce show up, um, Anthro is wearing Metron's symbol uh, because he's been able to have the life equation and we see him at the end of his career and then we see that lead into the return of Bruce Wayne, which is Batman rediscovering himself. But uh, yeah, I, I just took it as this, um, you know, what is the opposite of there being nothing? Something, the, the flaw in things, the stories we tell, the change. It's like Metron gave him fire and uh, that was the beginning. And now every time someone gets chosen by a lightning bolt or they land on a world with a sun or a bat flies through the window or you get bitten by a radioactive spot, whatever it is, you're getting what you need to, to move on to the next stage. You, you are, you are coming in contact with the black monolith in, in 2001. That, that's how I took it. It's like the, you know, DC has a very well pseudo well-known caveman character. We're throwing the God of information at him. That's how big this story is. We're going to see the beginnings of the entire thing. So, yeah, no. So it's very, very cool. So there's not enough time to do anything more than allow Superman to see this device, right? And he commits it to memory and uses his vision to, to see how it's constructed. And of course, when we get to the final issue of Final Crisis, he and the rest of the DC Universe, heroes and villains alike, Lex Luthor and Savannah, they have their, their role to play as well after they had, uh, you know, turned the tables on Libra and actually joined in on the fight against the minions of Darkseid. It's a great moment. I love the Superman Lex moment uh in, in that it was great see lex luther man was coming through in the clutch what a great luthor moment of being so angry at libra that to think that like i need you to defeat superman what are you insane i am lex luther and, and this whole thing just builds up to this point of like 
of course I betrayed you. I, I am Luthor. I am the, the hero of this story. Not you, not your ridiculous God. Like I am Luthor. And then that puts him in line with Superman. And again, it's like every piece was necessary to ensure the survival of existence. Yeah, with Lex in particular, it's funny because even going back to Infinite Crisis, Alexander Luther, huge part to play. But our Lex had not a ton to do, but when he shows up, it's it's to great effect. And, you know, similarly here, it, it totally tracked too. There's no way Lex would renounce science, worship this god right? Again, have to rely on someone else to take care of Superman. None of, like, all of that is antithetical to who this guy is. So the fact that the first chance he gets, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll turn on Lieber. That absolutely tracked. Before Superman returns to the present, and when he does, it's heat vision, full blast, and he's enraged, and this is the point uh, where he finds Batman. But prior to that, we do have this moment, right? And it's it's uh, it wouldn't be a crisis event, I suppose, if we didn't have red skies and if we didn't have Superman cradling the lifeless body of a fallen ally. And th this is the, the the point in the story where Batman, in issue number six, he makes a once in a lifetime exception to his rule about firearms. He had ha had held on to the bullet, right, and and um, understood that the radion substance is is uh, deadly to to the new gods. And he fires this bullet, and of course, as he does it, he's struck by the Omega Beams. Uh, I mean, I don't know, just generally, any 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 thoughts on it generally? And also, have having read it so many times and having read the Morrison Batman run and all of that, have has your view of the scene and and uh, Batman's apparent death, has it changed at all over the course of, of these years? Uh, no, no, it hasn't. Um, well, one thing that I, I very much like about that scene is Batman is immediately punished and not that i think that he needs to be that's not what i'm saying what i'm saying is this is a man who has sworn never to use firearms and sworn never to take a life and he is as devout to that as any of his villains are to any of their gimmicks and he has made a very conscious decision which is you are the god of evil you are destroying everything that is the only way i can be 100 percent certain that you will stop is if i use a gun on you because that means I am giving in to the darkness you have wrought on my world. If Batman has to use a gun, how bad have things gotten? And the Omega Sanction, which famously you can't outrun, even though they did in JLU, uh, immediately unmakes him. And it's almost this, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I always read it as as Batman saying, well, yes, of course I need to die now. Like I've, 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 if I've accomplished anything, I've accomplished this and, and I, I have to go away and I have to be done. And, and of course the follow up return of Bruce Wayne is about him redefining that character, rediscovering what it is and, and, and regaining his memory back. So in a lot of ways he, he does die, even if he doesn't, you know, physically shuffle off the moral coil, but I think it's a great scene. I really do. And, and Morrison has written, you know, Batman, probably more than they've written Superman. I, I mean, yeah. really just spent time in the trenches with that character. So I, I think that was done with a lot of love and a lot of respect. And when Batman just says, gotcha, it's just this, again, it's everyone has to have their moment and Batman gets his. And it's like, I, I know what's going on here. I'm the world's greatest detective. I, I am making a sacrifice at the altar of your evil to make sure that you don't hurt anyone else that I care about. And I just think it's a great scene. Yeah, there definitely does seem to be peace and acceptance. And I hadn't really thought about it in those terms that he's, yes, he's making this exception, but he's breaking this vow and that marks the end of this phase of his journey. It's uh, it's Superman after defeating Mixes Pit Lane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And whatever happened to the man of tomorrow. And he immediately, he immediately walks into the room with the gold kryptonite. He has a room with gold kryptonite. I mean, again, like this is, this is like, the, the man who has ultimate power is all good. And when he fails that, he finds the need to be punished. And it's the same thing here. It's like, I know I'm not walking away from that. I know Darkseid has the Omega. Like he's, he's it's, it's, it's his, you know, it's his most well-known power. So it's like, he, he knows he's going away. And uh, I, I think it's a great scene. I, I return to, obviously we don't have time to discuss this, but I, I remember, Back when we did this with Dan Greenfield, I remember saying that 
Return of Bruce Wayne was another book where the first time I read it, I was like, what is this? What are you talking about? And then again, I, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And I read it again and I read it again. And I remember even while we were recording, I had another breakthrough about that. Um, so again, it's just this like, you, I didn't read any of this stuff once and immediately love it. I, I had to work at it just because I couldn't get it out of my brain. I guess it's, I wonder if Batman hadn't gotten Omega beamed, what would he have done after that? If he had shot Darkseid, but hadn't been quote unquote killed in that moment. Well, I like to think that, uh, again, going back to the the late great Darwin Cook, that he would have retired and that Terry McGinnis would have taken over as Batman and uh, he would have sat behind the back computer and yelled at him while a dog slept at his uh, side. There you go. Yeah. There you go. I do. I also give Morrison credit for not dragging it out or hiding the ball as far as Bruce being alive. And it was such a great, essentially, post credit scene. Right? <laughs> when we get to that final issue and there's the page of white and we'll talk about what that represents. But then, and you think you're done. And then we're back in the past with Anthro in his final days and Bruce in the cave. And yeah. I, and I thought it was, it was great. And because it's like, okay, again, the story never ends. Yeah. And we know he's coming back. That's the thing. And I think it respects the audience and acknowledges like, okay, we're all on the same page here about what we're doing. You know, he's going to come back. Hey, if we have this mini series coming out, if you want to follow him, but if not, it's like, <laughs> you don't need to, right. You can just sort of, you know, that he's out there. Yeah. Uh, so you're, I, you're I like wearing a Batman shirt. There's going to be another Batman movie. There's going to be another, ba I, you know, Graham Morrison can kill Batman all they want. Batman's still coming back. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So, you know, they at least show like, no, this is, this is what comes next. Like Batman gets to be, uh, reborn and, and, and figure out why they want to, why he wants to continue doing this. So by the time we get to the final issue, dark side has more or less been defeated though. His presence continues to linger even to the point where when Superman is building that miracle machine, the essence of dark side is still taunting him. And it's, it's ultimately through that whistle, the use of music, dark side always hated music, mm. uh, that is able to do away with what's left of him. But again, the damage has been done and the, world is the, multi, the entire multiverse or just our earth just our earth it's falling apart oh i i read it as as every earth everything every you know dark side has as has fallen through and is dragging everything down like a sinkhole the shadow fell across the multiverse right yeah so so everything's falling apart people are being shrunk down and and stored to be uh, yeah. re revived <laughs> later you know lois even uses the word fridged and you know we've we've, yeah. well, we've talked talked about fridging certainly when we did our identity crisis episode but there's a different spin on it this is one we can all we can all get behind right this idea that humanity is being preserved in this way and then brought back i i love that too that was another concept that took me a while to to get in my head it was like what is going on here and then i realized like oh they can't stop fighting like they, they can't stop fighting. Like the, the world has shrunk. Entropy has won space and time. There's no heat left. Like they're down to this tiny little chunk of nothing. This and last outpost. This, yeah. This is it. This is all we've got left and they're still fighting and they don't know that Superman is going to remake the universe without dark side with the miracle machine, but they're still fighting. And I, I love that. I love that you know, Lois is still there, still printing out the Daily Planet. She's she's writing it, you know, by hand if need be. And I, I think that's great. I think that speaks to why these characters have endured along with Superman. Like they all have something to do and they all play. Um, and then the, the other thing I just want to go back to is, is it is a whistle, but, you know, that's very important because the idea of the multiverse as defined in DC is always about vibrations, right? It's... Um, uh, the flash vibrates at a different frequency and they go to a different world. And I, I don't forget, I don't remember who it was who said it, but they said basically, well, every world's got a flash. Everyone's got someone who can transverse the bleed and go somewhere different. Um, and in Superman Beyond, they talk about how to go different places. You need to be harmonized. You need to make music. And I love the idea that travel is linked again with creating something uh, with, with they, they literally show Captain Marvel again, the, the, the noblest, the purest of, of all the Superman archetypes. Uh, the, the first Superman clone, if you think about it that way is actually playing a harp to guide their shift ship through the various realities because he's like, Oh, this makes sense to me. You know, a magic lightning bolt hits me. I reverberate in a different thing. I become my ideal self. When he, when he whistles, when he makes the musical note, it's his way of saying, well, I understand 
that the the universe the universe is sound the universe is vibrations the universe is a uh, uh, harmony so he gets that and he embraces that and he he creates the perfect tune that realigns existence to go back and to allow everything to continue the way it was so again it's it's this um you know it's going back to the theme like the the flashes run the shift shift sail the stories we tell our vibrations everything is part of this same thing and superman gets that and he's like yep i'm completely up to speed i know what i need to do and everyone else is like well if anyone can do it superman can and of course dark side hates music the dark side hating music that that's a thing right yeah i didn't know that at the time i just thought it was a great line because you think of music as something that makes you happy and and everyone's got their own type of music and i just thought like yeah of course music's probably outlawed yeah, it's like he feeds on despair music makes you happy usually yeah 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 yeah, yeah. apparently it's a it's a very specific reference to uh one of the fourth world stories. I have to be honest with you. I, I don't remember that specific thing, but uh, again, it it's great that I love that scene so much that it references a comic I read and I didn't even remember that again. That, I feel like that's the appeal of crisis of, of really any event comic. If, if you can appreciate it without necessarily knowing what it's referenced, it probably did its job. Yes. No, that's the thing. Cause you read it and it's like, Oh yeah, it makes sense that dark side would hate that. And so again, he's able to to finally deal with what's left of Darkseid, and then Mandrak is waiting, right? So this final evil at the end of the story that's here to, the story that never ends, but that's here to devour everything. And what I love here, I, I said this earlier in the episode, but I loved Superman's calm throughout the story. And with Ultraman in particular, there were a couple of instances where Ultraman was really coming at him and Superman says something along the lines of like, yeah, I've heard all these threats before, or, you know, sounds like a challenge to me, right? He's just always, he's always up for it. And similarly here, a Mandrak is talking about, there's no light, there's no energy, there's nothing left to power this miracle machine. And Superman doesn't miss a beat. And he's like, I'm a living solar battery. And if it takes everything I've got to power this up, I'll do it. And looking at connection points, that, call to mind the final Morrison arc from JLA, World War III with Mageddon, right? Where he's able to, just as he absorbs sunlight, absorb the anti-sunlight of Mageddon mm -hmm. if, if memory serves. So it was a nice, I think, call back to that. I really, I really, really like that. Yeah, I, I think uh, Mandrak and Mageddon are very similar because they're both, they're, they're both uh, representations of the idea that um, you, you should you should want to struggle. You should want to, to, to move away from anything that feels good. You, you, and again, you, you wouldn't do that willingly, but it still happens. So, so they're, they're, they're kind of the same, uh, villain in that way. Mandrak, I do like that he is specifically a vampire because he's not only saying there's nothing left. He's saying, if there was, I would take it from you. You know, I would drain the more, the more you live, the more you do, the stronger you make me. And Superman's just like, Calm down, <laughs> calm down. I, I'm not really too concerned about you. Uh, we'll deal with you in time. But, uh, but yeah, Superman always has an answer for everything because that's, you know, that's his story, right? That's like, he, he's going back to the Fleischer error. It's like, it's not a question of if he's going to win, it's how is he going to use his brilliant mind, his great strength, his dedication to his friends. Like there's, there's going to be a victory, but you're never going to know how. And this is another great example of like, I don't know, I'm pretty much the sun. We're going to get through this. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it was it was great. And we don't see him articulate his wish for this miracle machine. But as the pages unfold, the army of the Superman arrive and the Green Lantern Corps arrive. We get that great moment that you mentioned earlier in the episode with the with the stake through the heart, the emerald stake through the heart of of Mandrak. And it's not until the final pages, the last conversation between Nix Wotan and his love interest i'm not even going to attempt that I, name. yeah i wouldn't but she asked what he you know what he wished for and he says nick says he's superman he wished only the best for all of us he wished for a happy ending love it yeah I, I, that's the whole story right that, that's it right there it's like the the final crisis all of fiction stood up to defend itself from 
in existence. And it's like, well, what did it come down to? It came to Superman. Why was Superman able to triumph? Because he only wants what's best for everyone. Like he probably wants what's best for Lex, for Darkseid, for everyone else. He's like, if you're happy, you're not going to be miserable to everyone else. Like what's the best way to ensure that Lois isn't hurt again? Let's make everyone happy. Let's give them what they want. Let's make, you know, work towards a purpose. Uh, you know, I always go back to, um, I think it was an all-star Superman where he says to Lex, like, if you really cared, you'd have fixed things years yeah. ago. You know, you'd, you'd have fixed things years ago. It's like, if if, it, if, if me disappearing meant that you were going to fix the world, I would have done that, but that's not going to be the case. And it's the same thing here. It's like Superman genuinely wishes for everyone to have the best. So when he, when he sings it, the universe responds. I realized a couple of things at, well, as I was reading and especially as we've been talking about it, I think one of the reasons why... I initially bumped up against Final Crisis and Superman Beyond in particular. I think one of the reasons why, and the audience knows this well, I tend not to gravitate to the magical or supernatural stories involving Superman. I think it's because I, I identify or try to identify or try to see as much as I can through the eyes of Superman. And I guess in those contexts, when we're in the realm of the magic, the supernatural, the cosmic, I have no frame of reference. And so it's just, it's, it's just such a foreign idea and maybe why I gravitate more towards the metropolis base or the earthbound, or even, even when he's in outer space, it's still, again, more digestible as opposed to when the, the laws of, of time and space and physics go out the window. So I feel like the tether that I have to the character when he's in those situations that I really can't fathom in any way, I feel like I'm, more removed. I really realized that as I was, as I was reading this and then a major positive though, you know, over the years doing this podcast in particular, like I've been asked in interviews or I've addressed in articles I've written or when I'm on other podcasts, like, well, why Superman? Or I do 130 episodes <laughs> on Superman and I have a variety of answers and it's multifaceted. But one of them, one of the prongs of my answer is always that yes, he's the first superhero, he's the archetype, he's the one everyone flows from, but in some way, shape, or form. But he's also the last in that, I've always said, if there ever were a final DC comic story, and I don't think we'll ever see that, except for this, <laughs> but it's like, if there ever were a final story, and that's why I, he, he would be the last one standing. He would be the one making that last stand against whatever the threat is. And I think that's why I've really come to appreciate Final Crisis because that story showed us that. That showed us that Superman was the one at the end of everything. Reality itself has crumbled. There's no light. There's no energy. There's no spark. There's nothing left but Superman and this parasite that wants to devour everything. And yes, he has the machine and he has the solar energy in, inside of him. We have a, a you know, kind of a rational explanation, but it's ultimately, it's the will, it's the spirit, right? It's that spirit that can never be stopped. And even if he didn't have the miracle machine, he somehow still would have wished, he, he still would have enacted a happy ending. Yeah. And that's what this story showed. So it brought to life this, th this core idea that I've always felt. And I realized that as I, as we've been going through this and I love it. Yeah, and even the Miracle Machine was a Legion of Superheroes story, and the Legion of Superheroes are Superman's friends from when he was a kid. I mean, the the universe folds back in on itself to give him what he needs because he's been very good to it. Um, so yeah, I, I I think that's a great way of saying it. I always go back to Morrison loves Superman. You love Superman. It makes sense that on some level you're going to see it from from the way they do. Um, certainly, you both like the character more than I do. So when I talk about Superman Beyond, I'm always like. <laughs> I'm always like, this is this is one of the good ones. This is one of the ones I really like. Listen, we've talked about this on other podcasts, but when you and I went to San Diego Comic Con 2016, we saw Morrison walking out of the convention center. <laughs> you creepily followed him and dragged me <laughs> along with you. And I was like, what is the end game here? And we we just walked after them for a little while and then we parted. But now I'm like, oh no, I should have gone up to them. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I've I've met them a, a few times, uh, you know, just like passing like as a fan to signatures and, and pictures and whatnot. But that day I was just like, I don't know, it's San Diego. You never know. You, you know, I've I've you know, I've 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 had great conversations with people you, you meet uh, waiting for drinks at the bar or somewhere else. So oh, I have we I will we will wrap this up, I promise. <laughs> but 
Uh, I want to address the monitors at the end. And I also have a question that I was wondering. So like we've been talking about this whole time, you have the dual threats of Darkseid, the shadow he's casting over the multiverse, but then Mandrak, who's waiting at the end of everything. To what extent is Darkseid influencing or affecting or having an effect on what Mandrak is able to do or vice versa? Like, is it just that Darkseid has, has, has caused reality to crumble and that's kind of opened the door for Mandrak or has made it easier for Mandrak to devour? Like, to, to what extent are they, are they having an effect on each other? Yeah, at the end of Superman Beyond, they say, well, Mandrak is going to be committed to the germ worlds, right? So, you know, Mandrak is going from uh, heaven or the overvoid or whatever you want to call it, the 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 realm of imagination and the immaterial, and they're being born in the the the, the, the material, right? Uh, and when they're being born, they could be whatever they want. You know, Mandrak could have turned into any number of things. But I read it as, well, because the the material is sick, and it's breaking and it's being destroyed because of what Darkseid did. Mandrak is immediately able to 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 flourish into its into its super demonic form. Um, that's at least that's how I read it because um, it does seem like you're a, you're you're fighting two villains that basically have the same gimmick of we want to destroy everything that isn't us uh, immediately. But like I said before, I, I really think it was important for Morrison to have someone that they could punch. And with Darkseid, it was like, no, it's, it's, it's Turpin. Batman's going to make the sacrifice. But you know, you do want that, like that, that moment, that moment that reminds you like, these are physical characters and they've got a physicality to them. And that, that's why I love when the, the Green Lanterns show. And again, it's not just the Green Lanterns. It's like, you know, Arthur Curry returns and Barry Allen returns and Wonder Woman throws her mask off. And like the, the, you know, you can almost hear the, the justice league unlimited theme or the, the Christopher Reeves theme or the Fleischer theme, just like beaming. It's like the heroes have a, a, a beachhead and they are going to use it because that is what they do. And they, they all get this great moment. And, you know, Mandrak just shows up and he's like, I hate all of you. And they're like, we don't care. We're not, you're not going to win the day. Yeah. No, I appreciate get, you're getting your take. Also, let me say to the audience, especially for those of you who are well versed in Final Crisis, if you have a different interpretation of anything we've talked about, or you happen to know differently as far as what was intended, please reach out. As clearly, Mike and I are interested in this process of discovery. So, really, please do feel free to reach out. And then, I guess, lastly, with the monitors at the end. So. Nix is restored to his position as monitor. They want to honor him. And he's like, this is meaningless. We need to, we need to withdraw. We shouldn't interfere. We're doing more harm than good. And he has that final conversation with Deja, Deja Will, Deja Dill. I'm so sorry. I, I can't the do the monitor have, names. The names have escaped yeah. me. But his, but his friend, and, and as they're talking, they know it's the end and it's a goodbye. And the white around them is, is growing until we just get that holy blank page. So, is the is the implication that the monitors there it's no longer this race of monitors they have sort of reverted back to that blank page conscious overmind that we overvoid that we started with uh, yeah yeah so that's that's how i read it um uh spoilers for the invisibles that is the last that's also the last page in the invisibles um the 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 page dissolves through the characters and the main character says our sentence is up which if you've ever talked to a fan of the invisibles they'll immediately know what that sentence means and there's whole books written about it uh, and the same thing happens at the end of final crisis and then if you read the multiversity which again is is the follow-up to most of the big points of uh, final crisis including the monitors they say in that book there is no longer a monitor race they're gone. Okay. It's just super judge. And they've, I don't remember if they say it in final crisis, but they certainly say in multiversity super judge. Nix Wotan is the son of the original monitor from crisis on infinite earth. So the idea is that okay. character is no longer around, but super judge is, and then they exist in material space and they're here to help us. And they're here to connect to the God realm. If we need to, if we need to fight the gentry or whatever other big bad happens to show up. So I think that was, that was Morrison's way of saying, well, like we have all these characters and they're doing more harm than good, but what we really need is to, you know, live amongst you. Right. I'm sure there's a, one or, one or two religious stories we could pull out of there. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's how I read that. And again, I, I think if you read the multiversity, it is explicit, um, but also there's 
that's not always good for him because he actually in multiverse V he becomes corrupted and he becomes one of the villains too. So oh, no. <laughs> it's this idea of if something is worth having, it's worth sacrificing for. That's how I read the end. Like he could spend the rest of existence with this uh, person that he loves and who he clawed back from unreality to be with, but he knows that's just, that's going to cause more problems. So he chooses to come back down and live with the rest of us and, and hope to, help when he can. And I, I think appending super to his name is a way of saying, well, I would just watch Superman save everything. I'm going to learn from that example. Interesting. And we do see him wake up on earth after, after that. Fascinating. So, you know, we've mentioned multiversity a bunch of times. I own it. I own a copy of the trade. It's sitting on the table in between us. I have not read it yet. I, I, I will. I don't think it would be an episode of this podcast, although it might have we might have another avenue, another another place for it at some point. I, I will say, after going through fifty two and now this, there there are definitely some offshoots and follow up projects that have spun out of things we've talked about that I am now more curious about. And what I will say, even really not knowing any of the specifics of multiversity other than what you've just shared, I really do admire Morrison for mapping it out. And again, going back to your demonstration at the comic shop where you gave us that lesson, <laughs> I, I think, because one of the things I said when we talked about 52, I was like, I don't feel like DC really capitalized on having this multiverse. And I look at what Morrison's done. It's like, hey, at least there was an attempt to, to build this out and make something of it. So I really do admire and appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Listen, as, as we approach three hours. I really, I thank you so much for coming along. Uh, you know, I, I knew I wanted to have you for this one. I'm glad we got Ralph in the first time that we did this, but I wanted to bring you in and I'm glad that again, I didn't know what this conversation was going to be before my reading project. I really thought it was going to be different. I thought, you know, I know you came in thinking you were going to have to convince me. I think <laughs> I thought that initially too. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be happier with the experience that I had returning to this and finally getting out of it what I always wanted to. I know there's still more to sort of peel back and I'm sure future readings down the, <laughs> down the road will, will, will do that. But I, again, I just had a great time working with the material. I really had a great time talking to you about all of this. Is there anything else that we didn't get to that you're like, I can't sign off before I say this? Uh, the only thing I would say is if you're listening to this and uh, we sound like crazy people, I just want to echo what Anthony said read it, tell us what you got out of it, tell us why you didn't enjoy it, or or tell us what you did, uh, why you didn't, and, and we didn't mention it, because I, I don't think this is meant to be read one way. I, I don't, uh, I think one of its greatest strengths is everyone gets a different thing out of it. Uh, some of that tends to overlap, but, you know, it's it's not binary, it's not one thing or the other. So, yeah, please, if all this sounds like complete nonsense, let us know. I'm, I'm always up for talking about Final Crisis and I try to be respectful of everyone's opinions because I know it took me a while to get to like it. I just happen to like it very much. Well said. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, audience. As always, I really appreciate you tuning in every week, but especially when we have these monster installments. So thank you for bearing with us. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. I really did. And I hope the audience did as well. Red Skies will continue with Chapter 9 next week. We'll be getting into Flashpoint and Flashpoint Beyond, so don't miss it. And as always, it's about what you do. It's about action. This show is part of the Flat Squirrel Podcast Network, home to Digging for Kryptonite, another exciting episode in The Adventures of Superman, Summoning the Zords, and My Comic Shop History, available wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review today. Sign up at patreon.com slash anthonydesiato for additional content. Thank you all.